Good afternoon from uh, Paris, where I am today. My name is Sara Bonella. I am Deputy Director of SICAM Headquarters. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our final session of the second season of the Mixed Gen SICAM series. We have uh, what I think is going to be a very interesting and rich program today. I would like to ask our, our speakers to um, turn on their cameras so we can all uh, show our faces to our participants. The theme for today is uh, how to simulate quantum materials. And our experienced speaker is Antoine Georges from Collège de France and the Flight Iron Institute. Before we get into the thick of things, I would just like to remind you that the idea of this series of events online is to enable uh, our community to, to keep interacting as much as possible, even at, in, a, in a moment in which it has been more difficult to actually do this in person. Hopefully this will change in the near future, but see, we are still navigating somewhat uncertain times. And so here we go. Also, the notion of the mixed gen is to try to uh, mix generations, so to enable younger members of our community to uh, show their work and interact with our uh, experts uh, throughout the year on different themes. And we've had a really interesting, I think, series of lectures ranging from rare, rare events to machine learning to different topics in electronic structure. And today we touch upon uh, simulating quantum strongly correlated materials. Um, there isn't much that I want to, to tell you before we actually get going with the science, which is, of course, the most important part of, of our afternoon together. Uh, I just want to share with you a few, uh, by now, rather standard points of, uh, of uh, practical information uh, for what we're going to do. So um, this session, like all mixed gen sessions, is recorded be aware of this. We're going to start with a talk from Antoine, and this is going to be uh, an extended talk. And I will ask you to uh, let me know if you have urgent questions during the talk itself. In order to do that, please type uh, your question in the Q&A feature. This is the only communication channel that you have with us in this first part of the event. So you write down your question, and I will relay it uh, to Antoine. This is to enable a, a, a smooth uh, sort of, uh, you know, a smooth, a smooth derailment of the whole talk. Now, more general questions or less pressing questions can be asked at the end of the talk. And for this, you will have an opportunity to actually ask your question directly to Antoine. So what uh, you should do in order to take advantage of this opportunity is signal always in the Q&A chat that you do have a question to ask. And then uh, at the, uh, when, when your turn comes, you will be invited to unmute yourselves. That's where you will be able to actually ask the question directly and interact with our speaker if, if need be. Uh, for the third, second, third, and fourth talk that we have today, these are going, given by junior participants. They are a bit shorter, around 20 minutes long. And what we're going to do is we're just not going to interrupt those presentations. So please ask all your questions at the end of the talk. And in order to do that, let me know in the Q&A that you want to do that. You will be invited to unmute, and then you will be able to ask your question directly. Now, as I said, the Q&A is the only communication channel you have with us. You will not appear on video. You will not be able to use the chat uh, feature on Zoom. This is simply to enable us to run things more smoothly. Hope it's not going to be a problem for you. Before I give the floor to Antoine, uh, just let me, oops, maybe I can do it. Yes, uh, let's just let me um, inform you that as always at CCAM, we are very, very interested in understanding what you think about our activities. And so we have decided to impose on registered participants to this event, and you will receive a short survey in which you will be asked a few questions that help us improve what we're doing. Um, the Mixed Gen uh, series has been running now for two years. I think this is a successful experiment. We've had very positive feedback from all of you. So thank you for participating and joining us in these activities. There will be a third series in the fall. And um, we are also planning more of the other uh, online and, and hybrid events that we run in collaboration with the Marvel and CCR in Switzerland, in particular, the classics in simulations and modeling and the Marianne, Marianne Menside 
conversations. If you're curious to hear more about these activities, you know, always keep an eye on our website. You can also, if you're not registered already, join our web webinars mailing list. And this you can do, for example, by visiting the MixGen webpage, and you will see that on the top right corner of the page, there is a, a little rectangle that you can click to enroll in the mailing list. I really think that this is all I wanted to, uh, sorry, bore you with. So what I need to do is I need to stop sharing my screen and ask Antoine to uh, start his talk for us today. His topic is electronic structure of quantum materials with strong correlations, a dynamic and dynamical mean field theory perspective. Thank you, Antoine. Well, thank you very much, Sara. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, SECAM and the organizers for setting up this uh, nice series of events, and also thank very much uh, Sophie uh, Beck for accepting to give a complimentary lecture to mine, uh, which will be more focused on actual electronic structure calculations with DMFT, and also obviously uh, Yanis and Petra for accepting that their poster would be promoted to a talk at a quite short notice. Okay, so I will try to now share my screen. Let's see if I manage to do that. And put this in presentation mode. Is this all good? Okay, I'm gonna Perfect. assume this is, yeah, it thank is, you. thank you. Good, so I'm gonna assume this is all good. Um, yes, so the title of my talk is uh, Electronic Structure of Materials with Strong Electronic Correlations, a Dynamical Mean Field Theory Perspective. And uh, the word perspective here is important in the sense that um, dynamical mean field theory, especially its combination with electronic structure, is basically two things. It's on the one side, a computational framework that allows us to make quantitative calculations and predictions about the properties of materials with strong correlations. But it's also a conceptual framework which allows us to think about the physics of these materials with a, a, a somewhat original perspective that I will like to emphasize in, in, in the talk. Uh, so uh, the somewhat ambitious outline is the following. Uh, I will give you a sort of broadband introduction to the physics of strong correlations in, in materials. Uh, I, hopefully this will last about uh, 10 minutes, something like this. Then I will move on to establishing the main concept behind the, the dynamical mean field theory approach. Uh, that should probably combine, take uh, two third, uh, one, one third or half of the talk. And then I will move on to some uh, concrete illustrations. The first one will be uh, a theory of the mod transition based on the MFT that will put the phenomenon into perspective. And if I have time, moving into combining the MFT with electronic structure and what we have learned on this specific material, strontium 2 ethereum 4 which I will take as an example of the sort of things that the MFT can do for you. Okay, so uh, first uh, sort of introduction to um, materials with, with strong correlations. So one of the distinctive aspects of materials with strong correlations is that I like to say that they do big things, and big things means uh, rather spectacular phenomena, uh, often uh, with sort of big amplitudes. And the reason for this is that because of the strong interdependence of electrons, which of course originates in the strong interactions between electrons, that there are some collective phenomena that take place in those materials. And you'll see several examples in the following. This collective phenomena could be switching the material between the metallic and an insulating state, uh, having magnetism, which is a, obviously a collective arrangement of spin moments, uh, superconductivity, which is probably the archetypal quantum collective phenomenon, and so on. And these collective phenomena also pave the way to interesting functionalities and even perhaps uh, interesting applications for electronics, for example, but also fundamental questions in, in physics and, and chemistry. Uh, so let me give you uh, on the next slide a sort of uh, a, a overview of some of these collective phenomena. So here on the left is kind of a time-honored example of a, an oxide material, vanadium sesquioxide, which upon substitution of pressure 
uh, and temperature can be switched between different phases. And here you see that this material at low temperature can be either an antiferromagnetic insulator or a metal, but at higher temperature, this insulator can become a paramagnetic insulator, namely an insulator with freely fluctuating magnetic moments or a non-magnetic metal. And all these different phases are separated by phase boundaries and, and phase transitions. So you already see on this uh, phase diagram three times of collective phenomena in a single material. Uh, this is another uh, well-known example, which is the physics of manganites. Um, manganites uh, have a very complex phase diagram with phases like ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, charge order, and so on and so forth. And last but not least here, you see the infamous phase diagram of cupate superconductors, which upon doping can be converted from their parent state, which is a magnetic insulator, to a superconducting state through a very rich uh, diversity of various regimes, which are still the topic of active and interesting research these days. So uh, I, what I would like to do is to give you a little bit of an idea of which materials display strong electronic correlations. And for this, we can just look at the periodic table and Many of the materials with, with strong electron correlations actually involve either transition metals. And I remind you is that the first row of transition metals here correspond to the gradual filling of the 3D shell. Uh, but there is a second row here, gradual filling of the 4D shell, and here a fifth row, gradual filling of the 5D shell. Or also, and importantly, materials with rare earth or actinide compounds, which correspond respectively to the gradual filling of the 4F and 5F shell. And what these atomic shells have all in common is that they are fairly localized. They correspond to uh, orbitals that are fairly localized around the nucleus. So uh, as a result, in the most uh, extreme example of very localized materials, the electrons that sit in these orbitals just simply do not delocalize over, over the whole solid, but remain localized. And this is why some of the 4F uh, rare earth compounds have local fluctuating mom moments uh, despite being metallic. Uh, but of course, uh, they can also uh, form a band and hence lead to metallic behavior. And this is this hesitation of electrons between localized and iterant behavior which is a hallmark of the physics of strong electron correlations and also uh, absolutely key things that any theory of these materials have to understand. So you may want to ask uh, why, what's special about the 3D shell? Why is the 3D shell particularly localized? And this is really simple uh, 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 quantum mechanics. If you think about uh, the um, the radial wave functions of the hydrogen atom with the principal quantum number n equal three, uh, you immediately realize that the 3s orbital having to be orthogonal to 2s and 1s has to have nodes in the wave function. So it has to go pretty far away from the nucleus, which would be located at zero here. In contrast, the 3D shell uh, has angular momentum L equal two, which doesn't exist for N equal two and N equal one. As a result, it doesn't need to have a node. So here you see that the 3D orbital is more localized around the nucleus than the 3S and the 3P. And so that's why the 3D orbital can be considered as a fairly localized thing when we talk about materials in which the valence electron lies in the N equal three uh, shell. Uh, but I wouldn't like to uh, leave you under the impression that uh, these transition metal oxides and uh, the transition metals themselves and rare earth materials are the only uh, correlated materials in nature. Uh, other prominent examples are molecular materials. Here are two examples. Uh, here is the famous uh, full rain uh, crystals, uh, A360, where A is uh, typically an alkali atom. And the reason these materials are strongly correlated is that the typical electronic interaction energy is comparable to their kinetic energy of bandwidth. And this is because the, the molecular entities are pretty far apart in the crystal lattice leading to small bandwidth. And this notion of small bandwidth is a particularly important notion these days, in particular in view of you know, all the twistronics kind of uh, narrow bandwidth system. 
This is another example of an organic material. So these are all, uh, you know, organic systems. And uh, uh, this is uh, the BDT two-dimensional, quasi-two-dimensional organics, which again, as a function of temperature and pressure, display a very interesting and complex phase diagram. Again, an antifrog magnetic insulator here. Again, a power magnetic insulator and a metal. So all this looks very similar with different energy scales, of course, than V203. But here, this material does something even more interesting, which is that it has a superconducting state below about 14 Kelvin, which is pretty high TC. Uh, and of course, the sort of new kid on the block in the in the big family of uh, strongly correlated electron materials are uh, all the twisted uh, materials, starting with bilayer graphene and the discovery of superconductivity four years ago in, in this class of materials. And more generally, all the two-dimensional materials, twisted or not, uh, which um, are quasi 2D because they are van der Waals uh, bonded between layers, especially all the family, the very big family of transition metal dichalcogenized and other related materials. So the ability to make heterostructures of these materials or twisting these uh, bilayers allow to engineer systems with very narrow bandwidth, hence enhance considerably the relative strength of electron-electron uh, correlations. And this is what has led to the discovery uh, in TBLG of this uh, phase diagram as a function of temperature and uh, electronic density which display metallic phases, a multi-insulating state, and some superconducting domes on the side of the multi-insulating state. So you see all this recurring theme of uh, metal insulator transition superconductivity, uh, perhaps magnetism emerging in the context of uh, these uh, strongly correlated electron systems. So this, this was to give you a sort of broadband uh, overview of why strong correlations and uh, uh, what are, where do we find in nature strongly correlated electron materials. Now, I would like to emphasize uh, an important aspect of these materials, which I think is really common to all, which is that uh, local atomic physics is crucial in these materials. Uh, so let me illustrate this by a little cartoon. Here you see what is perhaps uh, uh, many theorists view of a solid, you have a, a, an array of hydrogen atoms with uh, one electron on each uh, atomic orbitals, and these electrons are localized on the atoms, but once in a while they, they try to hop. And of course, the whole thing about strong correlation is that this hopping process is difficult. So this cartoon immediately tells you that on short time scales, which is what's happening here, uh, the electrons have to be described as localized. Short time scales in physics means high energy. Uh, but on long time scales, the electrons may or may not succeed in being delocalized about the whole crystal lattice. And, and again, this is this duality between an atomic like picture, which leads to particle like uh, excitations, and a long time wave like picture of delocalized electrons that we need to uh, that we need to describe and that makes the problem a difficult problem. So to convince you that this uh, long time scale, short, uh, uh, short time scale, long time scale duality uh, is uh, real and apparent in experiment, I'm going to show you a couple of photo emission spectra uh, from uh, multi insulators or metallic correlated systems. The first example is a multi insulator. So for those of you who are not so familiar with what the photo emission spectrum is, you can think of it just as the density of states of available excitations in the system, especially excitations that are accessible when you remove an electron from the system, which is what photo emission is doing. And so uh, this is uh, the, the uh, photo emission spectra, total density of states of this material here, yttrium TiO3. And as you see, his Fermi level, as you see, this material has no excitations uh, around zero energy. So it has a gap, it's an insulator. Uh, but it also has a satellite peak here, which if you think in terms of atoms, if you are a chemist and you think in terms of a solid being built out of atoms, has a very, very simple interpretation. Uh, this material has nominally one electron in the G shell. And this process here is really an atomic transition, which amounts to remove this electron from the D shell and convert it into D zero. 
So you've emptied the D shell and this leads to a, a peak in this photo emission spectrum, which is, of course, is not a sharp atomic transition because the atoms talk you to each other in the solid and we have really a sort of broadband. But this is the physical origin of this peak. Of course, in contrast, if you do just a standard electronic structure calculation using the workhorse of electronic structure, which is density functional theory in some, say, local density approximation, uh, you will find that this material is predicted incorrectly, predicted to be metallic. And so describing properly the phenomenon of localization of electrons by interactions is really at the heart of the problem. So again, this sort of uh, satellite peaks that we call Hubbard bands uh, is nothing else than an atomic transition. There are things that are very easy to think about when you think in atomic terms, which is also a way to talk to chemists, but they are much more difficult to think about if you think in terms of block bands or band theory. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, a real atom, a real atomic shell is much more complicated than just a little cartoon of uh, the one S orbital of a hydrogen atom. And uh, generalizing a little bit, uh, we can uh, immediately see that it's going to be very important to describe properly the many-body eigenstate of each individual atoms to understand the, the physics of these systems, and we call them multiplets. So a multiplet is the uh, eigenstates and eigenenergies of an isolated atom, and we want to understand what happens to those when you put these atoms together into a, a crystalline solid. And uh, such, a, such an atom will have many more uh, interaction than just a screen on-site uh, electrostatic repulsion or how about you? There will be additional intra-atomic exchange interaction, for example, the famous Hunske peak that plays an important role, as you will see towards the end of the talk. So the second thing I want to say is that this sort of atomic view is not only important for insulators when the when the, the system is very localized, but also for metals, actually, when strong correlations are present. And this is another example, which is a close cousin of the previous one, strontium VO3, which is a, this time a vanadate compound, but which also has uh, a, a one electron in the G shell, because this is vanadium 4 plus. And what you see here is that now the system doesn't have a gap. Obviously, there is density of states near, uh, near Fermi energy. So this is a metal, and indeed, this is a metal. Uh, but it still retains this uh, atomic satellite, which corresponds to D1 to D0 transition. So this photoemission spectrum really illustrates the duality between the atomic point of view, which will allow us to explain that, or if you want, the short time view, and the long time wave like view, which is that eventually this material succeeds in forming delocalized wave like quasi particles. Again, we can compare this to what uh, density functional theory in some simple approximations would have to say. And what it would have to say is that uh, it would be a metal, which is correct. The bandwidth of this metal, which is depicted here as calculated from the FTLDA in the uh, dashed line is about twice too big as compared to what's predicted experimentally, to what's measured experimentally. So you see, this means that the available kinetic energy in the system is actually reduced by a factor of about two as compared to uh, the real, uh, to nature. Uh, another way to say this is that the effective mass of quasi-particles in, is enhanced as compared to the band theory mass by a factor of about two or 2.5. And uh, on the other hand, the, the atomic light excitations, as emphasized before for the case of the insulator, just cannot be described in this language. And this sort of duality was pointed uh, out early on, actually, about the same time that dynamical feed theory was uh, being uh, conceptualized in a very nice paper by uh, Atsuchi Fujimori and co-authors, uh, of which I give the reference here. Okay. So uh, this was to emphasize the sort of dual nature of uh, strong materials with strong electronic correlations uh, with you know, a long time quasi -part perhaps quasi-particle forming wave-like uh, way of thinking about the problem and a short time atomic-like uh, transition, um, atomic-like picture uh, of thinking about the problem. Before I go into how we can uh, capture these two aspects into a single theory, 
Uh, I will need a little bit of formalism. I, I'm not going to introduce a lot of formalism in this talk, but I need a little bit. And uh, the main uh, object that I'm going to need in the following is what's called the Green's function. So the Green's function is really uh, the following process. We consider our system, for example, in its ground state. And we introduce an electron at a certain time tau prime. We could also remove that electron, which is the opposite process. We let the system propagate with its own Hamiltonian, and then we uh, make an overlap of that wave function that we've created and that has evolved into with itself. Or if you, another way to say that is that we remove that electron at a little time tau and then look at this amplitude. So that is the, the Green's function, which is really an overlap of wave functions, at least at zero temperature. Otherwise, it's some sort of statistical average of these things. And a very convenient way to think about this is actually to use the so-called spectral representation, which is written here, which decomposes that wave function into all the eigenstates of the full many-body system, which leads to the introduction of the spectral function here. And you see here the overlap between, let's say we are at a zero temperature, B would be, for example, the ground state. So we remove an electron from the ground state and we look at the overlap of this wave function with all the wave functions, the many-body wave functions with one less electron. And we look at this uh, thing in a, a momentum and density and, and energy resolved way. So this is a kind of density of states, of excited states, uh, weighted by this matrix element and measured in a, uh, energy and momentum resolved way. Uh, negative omega would cost them to removing an electron. Positive omega would cost them to adding an electron. And of course, if we have a system without an interaction, this object is just a delta function because you're just filling band. And the only way to remove an electron or add an electron is to remove it in an already occupied band or add it in an empty band. And hence, this uh, density of state is just a single delta function. But of course, in a solid, uh, this object is, uh, is a lot more complicated and gives us a lot of information about the physics of the system. Uh, and this object, the Green's function of the spectral function, is really the key uh, mathematical object around which uh, DMFT is going to be con is going to be constructed. The nice thing is that uh, modulo some assumptions, uh, the spectral function is something which can actually be measured in real life in the lab. This is an example of a photo emission uh, line, uh, light line at uh, at a synchrotron. Okay, so enough for the formalism. I'm now going to give you some sort of overview of what dynamical mean field theory is about. And dynamical mean field theory is now already quite a time on our theory, it emerged about 30 years ago. And uh, the basic idea is to provide a theoretical description of the solid state based on atoms rather than just an, an, based on an electron gas uh, on top of which we would turn on interaction. So the atoms are really at the heart of the approach. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, DMFT is really two things. It's both a computational and theoretical method to actually compute the properties of many-body quantum systems, uh, which becomes exact in some limiting cases and as an approximation can be systematically improved. But it's also a conceptual framework to think about materials with strong electricity coalitions and understand and sometimes predict their physics. So what is the, the key concept? The key concept is that we have a, a, say a crystalline solid. It could be a molecule too. It doesn't need to be a crystalline solid. But this material is made of a bunch of atoms uh, which communicate together by exchanging electrons. And again, I want you to think of each of these, these atoms as uh, a small many-body problems in itself of which the eigenstates, if it was isolated, would be our atomic multiple. And because this problem is very complex, I'm going to think of this problem by focusing on a single atom. So this is the one here colored in dark at the center. And I'm going to think of the e electron exchange processes with the rest of the solid as the exchange of between the electrons on this uh, atom that I have singled out with an effective medium, which represents the rest of the system. So uh, for all of you who, has, who have done statistical mechanics, this is a very, very uh, familiar idea, which is also, also the one we 
we use when we construct the classical mean field theory of the magnetic system. We replace the system by one spin in an environment and write some sort of self-consistency condition, which tells me that this effective medium is nothing else than the rest of the system. So at the heart of the MFT, there is this notion of an atom in a bath. The bath is a self-consistent bath, which re represents the, the rest of the system. So in more, perhaps more uh, modern and commonly used now terminology, DMFT is uh, the poster child of what we call embedding or quantum embedding approach to the quantum anybody problem, where we're going to focus on one small entity coupled with uh, a reservoir in a self-consistent manner. And I have to tell you what the local observable is going to be. What is the main thing that we, that GMFT will first and foremost aim at calculating? It will be able to calculate many other things. But the theory is really based upon a central quantity, which is the on-site uh, Green's function. So I here denotes an atomic site of the lattice. I equal one, two, three, four, five. These numbers to different sites. And I'm going to focus on the processes in which an electron is removed or created at the same site uh, at the two different times. So this is the lo on-site local Green's function. This will be the key observable in the theory. Uh, if you uh, put DMFT in a more general framework and compare it to other theories like classical mean field theory for statistical mechanics or density functional theories, all these theories focus on the key observable. Uh, usual mean field, they focus on the local magnetization. Uh, DFT focuses on the local charge density. Well, DMFT focuses first and foremost on the local Green's function or local spectral function. And then this uh, process of exchanging electrons between my embedded atom and the effective medium is parametrized by uh, the dynamical mean field, which is really a quantum mechanical amplitude, a function of energy of time to take an electron from here and put it in the bath or the converse process. And you can think of this dynamical mean field delta as a quantum mechanical generalization of the bias field in statistical mechanics. So in statistical mechanics, we would have a spin, which is coupled to the bath by just the action of a bias field, which is just a, a number or a vector. But here, the concept is generalized to a full function, which depends on energy of time. So that's the general concept. And we will have to provide the theory with two things. One which describes the physics, the, the local physics of this atom coupled to the bath. And the other one, which we call the self-consistency condition, which relates the uh, properties of the bath to the rest of the system. So the key approximation, so up to now, there was no real, not really no approximation. We can always think of the problem in this way. But we need an approximation to close the loop. And the key approximation uh, that DMFT uses, at least uh, formulated here for one band system, we'll see how we generalize to multi-orbital or multi-band later, is to assume that what we call the self-energy of the system, which is a function in general of frequency and energy, of, uh, of sorry, of energy and momentum, is approximated as a function of energy only. So another way to say, to say that in uh, uh, real space is to say that the non-local self-energy sigma ij between two different lattice sites i and j is going to be approximated by only its local component. And of course, this is an approximation which we will be able to systematically improve in so-called cluster extensions of dynamical mean field theory by including uh, longer and longer range components of the self-energy. But here we are going to stick to the simplest approximation, the so-called single side dynamical mean field theory, in which the self-energy is, uh, is approximated as, uh, as a local quantity. And for those of you who are not so familiar with this concept, the self-energy is really the difference between the inverse of the interacting Green's function, g minus one, and the inverse of the non-interacting Green's function, the one that had a delta function like spectral function, g naught. So that's what the self-energy is. So it's a way to parameterize the, the difference between the Green's function of the interacting and the non-interacting systems. So at the end of the day, a dynamical mean field theory as I mentioned before, will be made of two equations. One which tells me how to 
what the dynamics of this embedded atom is. We call this an impurity model because we have we can think of this atom as an embedded impurity in a medium. Perhaps the terminology is not absolutely perfect, but this is sort of the established terminology in the field. So we have to define these dynamics and know how to solve it. And then there will be a self-consistency condition, which, re which tells me that the medium, the effective medium, is really just uh, the rest of the system. So there is no difference between the medium and the solid at the end of the day. Okay, so this is a sort of cartoon uh, explaining uh, the general scheme, but without equations. Once I solved this problem in a self-consistent way, I'll be able to calculate lots of things. I'll be able to calculate these two objects, which are the heart of the theory, but also the self-energy itself. And then there will be a lot of derived quantities that will be useful to calculate lots of other things. For example, the so-called local vertex function that will allow me for the so-called beta salpeter equations to calculate the full uh, momentum and energy dependence susceptibilities. And by also, of course, by inserting the self-energy into the Gaines function, calculating the full Gaines function of the software. So at this point, uh, this doesn't have very precise equations. I'm going to write the equations a little bit more precisely on the special case of the single band Hubbard model to keep the discussion simple, keeping in mind that all these can be generalized to, uh, to a more complex uh, system and even to real systems. So let's consider the Hamiltonian of the single band Hubbard model. And here, just to keep you awake, I used a slightly different set of notations. So now the atomic sites are, are, are used, are denoted by R and R prime. So previously that was I and J, but it's the same thing. Also my uh, creation operators are now D instead of C, just a small change of notation. You can think of this as D shell, for example. And my Hamiltonian is built of a kinetic energy term, which means that the electrons can hop on the lattice sites on the, between the atoms with a certain amplitude T and a, a bunch of local terms, which are the atomic energy. So really the Hubbard model is a collection of atoms and it's the simplest possible atom. It's an atom that has a single level, which is called here epsilon d, uh, and an interaction when two electrons occupy the same uh, atomic level, namely this configuration. So each of these atoms is really a super simplified atom in which there is just an atomic level, a single one, no degeneracy. And uh, it can be occupied by, in any of these four configurations. So it's atoms on the lattice coupled by hopping. And uh, what DMFT does is that it is going to it, it is going to describe the uh, quantum mechanical transitions between these four different states as time goes on, as the dynamics of this uh, atom in the bath problem. So previously, I, I showed you a cartoon of these dynamics. We had, a, we had a, here a, an atom coupled to the effective medium by the dynamical mean field amplitude delta. And here on that slide, I show you more precisely how this dynamics is actually defined. Here it is defined in the so-called action form. Uh, this uh, here is just a quantum mechanical quantization of just a, a simple single level atom. So this will be just the isolated atom. You recognize here the, the uh, Hamiltonian of the atom. And you have a time derivative here, which is just PQ dot, like in Hamiltonian mechanics, when you go from Hamiltonian to Lagrangian, we have to add PQ dot. And uh, here we have the hybridization term, which involves the dynamical mean field delta. Uh, and you see that this process amounts to destroy and create an electron with a certain amplitude delta of tau minus tau pro. So uh, you can think of this problem as uh, uh, an interacting problem with an effective non-interacting propagator, which is given by this expression here, but this is not the free propagator of the problem. This is the effective bare propagator of this impurity problem. So this, this uh, equation here, uh, defines uh, precisely uh, the dynamics of this impure of this atom in a bath or impurity in a bath in the case of a single uh, orbital system. And if you don't like actions and you want to stick to Hamiltonians, the thing you have to do is to introduce explicitly the degrees of freedom that describe the bath, uh, the effective path of the problem. 
So this is what's done on this slide. We have now kept our atomic Hamiltonian, still the same. But now we've explicitly introduced uh, degrees of freedom to represent the boat here and the bubbles and everything in the bath, and we call them A's. They are uh, auxiliary, uh, hence the letter A, auxiliary variables, which have energy levels. And the communication between these two things are parameterized by hybridization amplitude V, which transfer an electron from the bath to the atom and, and converse to. And you can, uh, of course, this problem is purely, uh, non, is purely quadratic as far as the A's are concerned. So you can integrate them out and you can map this problem precisely on this form, provide the uh, the delta omega in this case is is explicitly related to the v's and the e's in this for in the following way. So, if, another way to say this is that if you give me a spectral representation of delta omega, which is this, I can think of my uh, action problem as a Hamiltonian problem of, a, of an atom in a bath, but I insist on the fact that these are auxiliary variables meant to represent the bath degrees of freedom. So this Hamiltonian is very well known in the, and has been since the 60s. Uh, it's called an Anderson impurity problem, and it describes an atom in a bath, here a single level atom. Now what I have to do is to tell you something about the second part of the equation, namely this part here which is the self-consistency condition that tells me the, that the bath is related to the rest of the system. And uh, to do that, uh, we're gonna uh, relate the uh, Green's function of the lattice and the Green's function of the impurity. So the Green's function of the lattice in reciprocal space is given by this one over omega plus mu minus epsilon k minus the self-energy. Remember, this was the non-interactive Green's function. I subtract the self-energy. I get the momentum resolved uh, Green's function of the lattice. And by summing over k, I can construct the local one on site. So let me call this G local. And the key point is that the atom in the bath is meant to exactly reproduce G local. So G local is also G impurity. So here there is something called G impurity. These two objects are imposed to be the same. In other words, the atom in the bath problem is thought of as an exact representation of the local grids function. At this point, nothing, there is no approximation. The approximation again, as mentioned before, is gonna approximate the self-energy of the lattice that enters this equation as an object which is only frequency dependent, not momentum dependent. And the big assumption is that we're going to be able to replace this quantity by that of the impurity problem. So, of course, we can relate the impurity self-energy to delta and g impurity minus one by this equation. Remember, this quantity was playing the role of the bare gains function of the impurity problem. And this allows me to close the equation. Because if I put sigma impurity in place of sigma here in this equation, I can close this equation. And this is the second leg of the DMFT uh, equation, so the DMFT uh, framework, which is to impose that we have to solve this effective atom in the bath, delta, which is chosen in such a way that G impurity, the result of this solution, uh, satisfies this equation. And you see that this equation knows about the dispersion in the, in the lattice, in the crystalline system. So uh, in a nutshell, the DMFT equations can be uh, summarized in the following way. We have to solve an impurity problem in the bar, calculate the impurity Green's function, calculate the self-energy, and iterate this loop using the self-consistency condition in a way to satisfy this equation. And at the end of this, con of this process, provided it converges, we're gonna know everything we want to know about the system, namely the Green's function, the local self-energy, and be able to compute all sorts of derived quantities like response functions. So to draw a parallel with uh, other established frameworks, as I mentioned before, uh, you can draw a parallel with mean field theory, density functional theory. Uh, we focus on different observables, uh, we have in each case an equivalent system in mean field theory that would be a spin in an effective field. In DFT, that would be free electrons in an effective potential. In DMFT, that would be an atom in a bath. And the difference between DFT and DMFT is that here the reference system is a free system. It's a, a electrons in a in free electrons in a cone champ potential, which is self-consistently adjusted. But in DMFT, the reference system is an interactive system. It's a many-body 
atom in a bar. And the dynamical mean field delta is really the analogous object as the vice field in mean field theory promoted to something which is a function of energy, hence the name, the letter D in dynamical mean field, uh, or if you want the analogous thing as the cone champ potential in DFT. By the way, this is a famous picture from a Solvay meeting that shows you Pierre Weiss with a bunch of other famous people. Okay, so uh, you can ask, uh, how do I know this construction is any good? And to answer this question, you can first and foremost look at a few limiting cases. So the first limiting case is uh, uh, um, u equals zero. So uh, for u equals zero, uh, obviously our assumption is not an assumption because the self energy is zero and hence it's obviously k independent. So by construction, the MFT is exact when u is zero. But then you can also take the isolated atom, which is the atomic limit when t is zero. In this case, the atoms don't talk to each other. So obviously the self energy has to be only local and a function of only energy. So uh, the theory also describes the isolated atom when there is no Hawking. So it provides a smooth interpolation between the band limit of non-interacting system and the uh, atomic limit of isolated atoms super localized and hence an interpolation scheme, which is exactly both extreme. And for those who have a formal mind, uh, this approach is also uh, formally exact. So it provides an exact solution, let's say, of the Hubbard model in the limit of infinite dimensionality or infinite lattice coordination. Uh, uh, and it is indeed a paper by Metzner and Wolhart in 1989, which started thinking about all this and eventually leading to the elaboration of TMT. Okay, but by then, by now, uh, the theory has ramified into a very large number of extensions and also applications. I would say that I've described a little bit of the conceptual core of the theory, but the theory is deeply rooted into uh, a number of computational algorithms that allow to solve this problem of an embedded atom in the bath. And then it has a number of ramifications of generalizations which go beyond single side DMFT, for example, through cluster embedding, uh, aim at calculating response function and using them to improve the approximation and so on, and a very large number of applications to a number of problems. And by now you can find review articles for about all aspects of these uh, trees and roots and leaves uh, of this DMFT ecosystem. Uh, I would like to emphasize in particular a very nice series of books that are published. Uh, uh, by Eva Pavarini and Eric Koch uh, as a series of summer schools, uh, which are freely available on the web. Many of them deal with DMFT, not only. Uh, this is the sort of time honored review article that we wrote uh, like 25 years ago on DMFT, which is still a classic. And for those of you who want to see uh, much more detailed uh, online lectures on DMFT, you can look at my Collège de France lectures. Uh, you'll find all the all the slides and materials on, on, on them and the video recording, which uh, at this point are recorded in French, but there may be an English version at some point. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to emphasize that uh, at the root of this tree here uh, is really uh, what's happening under the hood. We need uh, powerful algorithms to solve these problems, these impurity problems, atoms in a bar. And uh, there's been a very large uh, uh, activity over the past couple of decades in developing ever more efficient impurity solvers, as we call them, for which algorithmic development is crucial. So there are various kinds, there are solvers that work directly with continuous bar, like the action form I showed before. There are solvers that require discretization in Hamiltonian form, which was the other slide I showed. Uh, there are various approximation schemes too. Um, and by now, there is a quite a nice uh, ecosystem of uh, available computer codes and libraries, software libraries that implement all these schemes, often in direct combination with electronic structure. And I've put uh, the most important ones, uh, about 10 of them, uh, on this slide uh, that you can uh, go to usually GitHub and the websites to actually download these codes and use them yourself. One thing I want to emphasize is that one of the workhorse, not the only one, but one of the prominent workhorse for solving this type of problems are actually quantum Monte Carlo algorithms. And 
there's been a breakthrough in the mid 2000s or so, uh, going from the sort of older Hirschfeld algorithm that used the discretization, the total discretization of the imaginary time to more modern versions, the modern algorithms that, that don't use a discretization and work directly in continuous time. There are many different flavors of that. I obviously don't have the time to go into any details. But uh, this has changed the landscape of uh, the sort of calculations we can do with dynamical mean fit theory, including for real materials, handling more orbitals and going to much lower energy and temperature scales than was previously possible. And of course, uh, more recent uh, developments of uh, uh, impurity solvers uh, are still ongoing and are very important to the vitality of the fit. Okay, so that was uh, my introduction, well, my introduction, my presentation of the core of the theory. Uh, Sarah, how much time do I have left? Well, I mean, you have about 10 minutes if you want. About 10 minutes, okay, great. So what I'm gonna show, uh, do in these 10 minutes is first show you uh, one of the early successes of DMFT, which is uh, providing us with a sort of consistent theory of the mod transition, which as you saw is kind of at the heart of many, many of these phenomena. And for this, you have to understand that uh, the mod transition is really a very uh, genuine phenomena that co consists in the gradual localization of electrons uh, as the typical ratio of interaction strength of our kinetic energy is increased. So we can go from a metal to an insulator at higher temperature, this phenomenon will be a crossover. Uh, going through a bad metal and poor insulator into a multi insulator. At lower temperature, we may end up into a situation like in V203 or in the capability organics in which there's really a first order transition between these two states of matter. And then in systems in which uh, this may or may not be, be visible depending on the material. If we, if we frustrate enough magnetic ordering, which is the zoo of magnetic phases here on this cartoon depicted in red, uh, we may reveal this phenomenon or not, depending on how uh, magnetic ordering is frustrated. Uh, the sort of uh, broadband uh, phase diagram for this has been recently uh, the, fo uh, the focus of increased attention in the framework of uh, transition metal dichalcogenides and especially forming moiré super lattices or, uh, by either twisting or making uh, hetero bilayers of these systems, uh, which lead to very narrow bandwidth system allowing to explore this in a very wide range of temperature and energy scales in a controllable way. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you is the solution of these uh, DMFT equations uh, in their most basic form, namely uh, just focusing on the non-magnetic phases and using as an impurity solver, a very, very simple one, which is approximate, which just amounts to solve the impurity problem by some sort of second order perturbation theory. So at the end of the day, the DMFT equations in that case can be summarized very, very simply in these two equations. We have to solve uh, the impurity problem given the delta for the local gauge function G. And we have to ensure a self consistency. And here we've taken a very simple form of it, which corresponds to a semicircular uh, lattice with a semicircular density of states, in which case this self consistency condition can be expressed just in this way with T the hopping amplitude. So we have to solve these two equations. And uh, when we do this with this approximate solver, this is what we get. And this is a little movie that I'm going to try to show you. If I manage, if I succeed, here we go. So what you see here is the total density of states of the system or the momentum integrated spectral function as the interaction is cranked up. So you see that, that we narrow the central density of states, which amounts to quasi particles with larger effective masses. And at the same time, we transfer the, the spectral weight to this atomic light -like excitation. So this is the lower Hubbard band and upper Hubbard band. And at some point, the quasi-particles disappear and we have a multi-insulator with a gap where only the Hubbard satellites remain. So this movie is, was obtained again by using a very approximate solver. And uh, basically it's an iteration of a nonlinear integral equation, which is summarized here. Usually the DMFT equations do not reduce to nonlinear integral equations. They are full 
they require the solution of the full local many body problem. But here, because we've used these approximate solvers, they reduced some learning identical equations. And if you go to the website of the TRIX software library, you'll find in one of the tutorials called the first DMFT calculation, you'll find uh, all the tools needed to reproduce this calculation yourself. And you see that the library is uh, uh, written in a compact way such that uh, coding all this stuff is only basically these two pieces. This uh, provides the impurity solving and this, this, uh, this is the self-consistency. And using the library, uh, you will be able to reproduce all these calculations. So what uh, this has achieved for us is to provide a theory of how a system evolves from a, a metal with quasi-particles everywhere to an insulator with no quasi-particles and a gap to a regime of a correlated metal that has narrowed quasi-particle bandwidth as well as have our satellites, which was the case of transfer VO3, as we, we saw before, uh, and treating on the same footing the uh, atomic local aspects, uh, atomic transition and Hubbard bands, and the long time quasi particle wave like excitation, uh, which was our, uh, I assigned uh, as one of our original goals at the beginning. So since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of things just to tell you that uh, that was the MFT for the uh, single band uh, one orbital Hubbard model. But uh, in the middle, uh, in the mid nineties, a very interesting set of developments took place between our community of, uh, of uh, many body theory with the MFT and the community of uh, real materials electronic structure calculation, trying to marry both of these worlds and uh, have a happy marriage where uh, DMFT can be used in the context of actual calculations for real materials with a structural and chemical realism. And uh, Sophie Beck, in her presentation, will elaborate a lot more on how this is done in practice. But uh, let me show you uh, a gist of the uh, general construction. So basically, uh, this combination between electronic structure and DMFT is done by uh, benefiting from the power of the EFT, so doing a cone sham calculations of the band structure and uh, isolating a, a specific set of, uh, of orbitals that we're going to call the correlated orbitals, like, for example, the 3D orbitals of the transition metal oxides. Uh, we are going to construct uh, localized uh, atomic like uh, functions that will define this uh, sub part of the Hilbert space. So, if you want localized value functions, and all the DMFT action will take place into this sub part of the Hilbert space, which is spanned by these uh, localized uh, atomic like or Vanier functions. So, it is within this subspace that we'll have this DMFT loop. So, we we'll solve an atomic shell in the bath rather than a full atom, really. And once we do that, we upfold back the self energy to the whole solid to recalculate the charge density in a self consistent way and go over this external loop, which is the charge density. Uh, so this has been applied to a very large number of materials uh, with uh, both uh, uh, quantitative success and also predictive power. One thing I want to emphasize is that in the context of a multi-orbital problem, the, 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 the key ansatz behind the MFT is a little bit more complex than just saying that the self-energy is momentum independent. The accurate statement is that when expressed in the basis of the local orbitals or local Vanier functions, the self-energy is only frequency dependent. But of course, when you upfold this quantity to the basis of block states for the whole solid, uh, this acquires momentum dependence through these matrix elements, which are the overlaps between the block functions and the Vanier functions. So these objects can be very momentum dependent. Hence, the accurate statement is that when expressed in the basis of local orbitals, the, the DMFT answer is that the self energy is momentum independent. But then when upfolded to the whole solid, it acquires momentum dependence. And uh, this can be applied, for example, to a materials like uh, strontium 2 ruthenium 4 which is an oxide uh, involving four electrons in the ruthenium D shell. This oxide has a very simple electronic structure uh, because the, the, these electrons live in a subshell of three levels among the five D orbitals, which is called the T2G 
shell of orbitals. And really you can think of its electronic structure in the following way. So we have three orbitals in this T2G shell, X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z. The X, Y orbitals hop in plane. So we should expect a circular like more or less Fermi surface, which has dominantly X, Y character, which is this gamma sheet here. And uh, these guys are much more one dimensional in this direction or this direction. The C axis uh, hopping is very small because the system is very layered, as you can see here. Uh, as a result, uh, these two uh, orbitals lead to quasi one dimensional sheets like this and this, which, however, reconstruct around the diagonal to give uh, way to a small pocket here and a square Fermi surface here, beta. So you see that uh, this uh, hand waving uh, derivation of the Fermi surface of this material that I just presented to you uh, has been early on confirmed by Arpes Rajols. Uh, this is the original findings of uh, Andrea Damascelli to clarify the uh, bulk versus surface states in this system. And uh, with modern photo emission and laser resolution, this can be now uh, determined with exquisite precision. And one of the predictions of the MFT uh, actually in this field is that the effective strength of spin orbit coupling was going to be enhanced by coalition effects. And indeed, you see that the spin orbit enhanced electronic structure matches the, which is on the right here, matches the, the experimental photo emission uh, Fermi surface much better than uh, without this enhancement. And this system uh, allows for such precise photo emission spectroscopy that these ansatz of locality in orbital space was tested directly experimentally from photo emission experiments. So photo emission experimentalists can measure the quasi-particle dispersion along these various angular sectors. And by expressing everything in the orbital basis, they were able to show that the extracted self-energy indeed collapses on two master curves, one for XZYZ and one for XY. A sort of independently modulo the scatter of the data points of the angle here of the cut that you measure. So this means that indeed the chief uh, dependence of the self energy is on energy and not on angle or momentum, uh, which uh, uh, is a direct validation of the DMFT assumption, at least within our bars for this material. And here you see a, a comparison between the self-energy calculated from electronic structure plus DM15, which are the plane lines, and this experimental determination of the self-energy. Here is the self-energy, here is the comparison between the measured dispersion of quasi-particles from RPES and the uh, uh, and, uh, uh, color map of the DMFT spectral function. And you see that there is a very beautiful matching between this, uh, uh, between this, uh, the theory and experiment here. Uh, I don't have uh, any time uh, left, but basically I want to emphasize that strontium tourism is a member of the big and happy family of materials that we tend to call Hunz metals, which encompass in particular the iron-based superconductors. Well, sorry about this. This is from a previous conference. And the uh, oxides of the 4D transition metal row. Uh, Hunz metals characteristic is that uh, the quasi-particle effective mass is lowered by the Hund's coupling, while at the same time, the materials are far from a mod transition. So Hund's metal are really a different route to strong coalitions, which is not controlled by the proximity to a mod transition, like, for example, uh, this material here or, or, or the cuprates, but can be fairly far from the mod transition, which has are these black bars here. And don't, but but having strong correlations because of the of the Hund's coupling. What's interesting in multi-orbital material is that this picture that you go from atomic multiplets down to quasi-particles is much richer. And in fact, uh, for this Hund's metal, it can be shown that this crossover between fluctuating atomic multiplets at high energy and the formation of quasi-particles and often a Fermi liquid at low energy goes into a sequence of crossovers, not a single crossover. And in these materials, which are Hund's metals, there are really two energy scales, two crossover scales, one in which the orbital degrees of freedom are quenched first, and then a much lower scale at which also the spin degrees of freedom are quenched, leading to the Fermi liquid state. So that DMFT has unraveled 
a new state of matter here, which is metals with fluctuating spins, but quenched orbital fluctuations, which can be detected by various experiments, in particular thermal power and uh, inelastic X-ray spectroscopy and so on. So really, uh, if you want to think about DMFT, to think about a solid with DMFT in mind, you have to think of this flow from atomic configurations into the low energy regime where quasi particles emerge and how the gravel coupling the, the coupling between the atom and the environment gradually lift the degeneracies which are present in the atomic multiplets to reach the low energy uh, the low energy universe in which quasi eaten and quasi particles form okay so uh, I'm going to end this talk uh, basically here, just a few uh, words of conclusion. So, of course, uh, the only thing I've presented is the so-called single side, completely local DMFT approximations. But as you can imagine, many extensions and generalizations have been proposed to actually uh, go beyond when necessary. So when the spatial correlations are somewhat longer range, uh, these uh, extensions go under the name of cluster extensions of DMFT, various flavors, but also so including long, long wavelength uh, fluctuations with vertex extensions, things like DMA or Trilex or dual fermions and bosons. And uh, these embedding methods more generally are controlled, at least the cluster extensions can be systematically improved by uh, including longer and longer range components of the self-energy. So it's a systematic procedure that can be carried on and sometimes, not always, but sometimes converge to a the exact solution of the problem. This has been achieved in some regimes of the 2D Hubbard model, for example. So here's my take-home message, which is that thanks to the development of DMFT, we now have a computational framework to address physical properties of materials with strong electronic correlations. But I want to emphasize that this is not only a computational framework, this is also a conceptual framework, which allows us to think about materials bridging the gap between the sort of high energy atomic real space or chemical picture and the low energy uh, wave-like momentum space quasi-particle picture. Uh, and uh, there are many things uh, to do, but just looking ahead, uh, we need uh, further advances on impurity solvers, uh, including more orbitals, uh, lowering computational time, being able to do direct real frequency calculations. There are many routes that are currently being explored, which are some of them are listed here. We're also doing a better job with long range correlations and interactions. And again, there are various routes to do that. And uh, all this comes with the uh, designing of new embedding schemes of which DMFT is kind of the embryo and poster child. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Antoine, for this very interesting introduction to the world of dynamical field theory. Uh, so the, the lecture is now open for questions. Just type on the Q&A that you want to ask a question, and then we invite you to unmute your mic to ask that question directly to Antoine. Maybe just, just to get things going while we give our uh, participants a little bit of time. So, so I, I was actually quite curious about this, um, you know, the, the range of validity of your single site approximation for the self-energy. And so I have sort of a sequence of related questions. Maybe I'll start by asking the first one. You gave us a few examples in which, you know, the approximation is exact or, or very valid. So when does it break? spectacularly uh -huh. if it ever does excellent question yes of course there are cases in which it breaks and um, i think the the key physical uh, uh, notion behind your question is what is the of range correlation. of the of, of the correlations corresponding to the various incipient orders that may want to develop in the system so if we take a given materials and we go to low temperature typically there will be stabilities to various forms of long range order could be magnetic could be charge order, it could be other things. And this comes with the correlation length, right? So as long as the correlation length is reasonably small, then the single side MFT local approximation is, is likely to be quite accurate. When the correlation length starts growing, then of course we need to go beyond. And the best example where everything fails miserably uh, in the single side form is cuprates. So in the cuprate superconductors, uh, 
the magnetic correlation length grows. It grows to infinity in the parent compound. In the weakly doped system, it doesn't grow to very large values, but it still grows to several lattice spacing. And so the role of short range, at least short range magnetic correlations is very important. So if you actually perform a single side DMFT calculations for the 2D Hubbard model, let's say, let alone cube rates in this regime, you're going to find that everything is very uniform around the Fermi surface because things are, you know, not momentum dependent. But in reality, we know that the low doping state of cube rates has almost reasonably defined quasi-particles near the diagonal directions, the so-called nodes, and very incoherent and basically no quasi-particles in the uh, horizontal and vertical directions, the so-called antinode. And in these directions, there's a pseudogap that form. So this phenomenon you cannot describe with single side DMFT, and it is first and foremost to describe this phenomenon that cluster DMFT, cluster extensions of DMFT were invented. And what was shown is that by expanding the range of the cluster to basically the coalition length or a little bit beyond, uh, you can do a very good job at describing uh, this phenomenon of the pseudogap, but you absolutely need this cluster extension for this. Part. Interesting. And so, so what has happened when things go wrong? Does does the self iteration fail to converge? Or no, you no, converge no, 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 some... no. You will converge to something, you, but you work but, 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 if, 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 but the thing is that if you then calculate, the theory has a red flag inside it. Okay, that was tell you yeah. that yes, absolutely. I, I I understand that was your question. It has a red flag, which is that if you don't just stop at calculating the single particle self energy, but if you just go a step further and calculate the full. Uh, momentum and uh, dependent spin-spin uh, coalition function, let's say, or charge-charge, mm -hmm. or any two-particle response function, and extract the coalition length from that, which you can do, because uh, you can do that in, in even in simple mean field theory, you can extract the coalition length. You will find that your coalition length is large, and in fact, you will find that the actual DMFT solution wants to be ordered. So you will get, uh, you will think that you are in the disordered phase, but in reality, there is a lower energy minima, which is odd. And this is a red flag. It should tell you, hey, you know, the coalition length is so large that probably you should go beyond single side. Okay, got you. Interesting. Uh, so while we wait for participants, well, the other speakers can also ask questions if they want to. Eh? Of course, this is not, uh, but I'll, I'll just keep, uh, I'll take advantage. Ah, we do have a question from Sergio Chuki. So, uh, Sergio, just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. Okay. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Good morning, George, Antoine. And well, my question is: is uh, if you have, if you can comment on the role of long-range interaction on a physical ground in the mode transition, if any, and um, what are how to include this long range inter interaction into this the empty scheme? Well, hello, Sergio. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to see you participating in this event. So, this is a, an important question, which is also not such an easy one. So, um, you to, to properly in, uh, include, as you know very well, the effects, uh, the dynamical effects of the of the longer range interaction, you need to go beyond the, the single site uh, standard DMFT framework because the longer range interactions strictly in single site DMFT are treated just uh, uh, the hot tree approximation for longer range interaction becomes uh, exact in the DMFT limit. So, obviously, uh, screening, for example, would not be properly induced uh, 100. So to do that, you need to resort to something that has been called extended DMFT, which aims at uh, imposing self-consistency both on one particle quanti quantities and on two particle quantities. So basically, you will treat screening uh, in the framework by imposing self-consistency for the self-energy, but also for the local polarization. So this is the door. Uh, this is the the way towards combining DMFT not with standard electronic structure uh, a la DFT, but with GW. Mm. Uh, so GW slash RPA can be combined with DFT by uh, treating screening from an ab initio perspective and imposing at the DMFT level uh, self consistent 
see both on sigma and on pi, the, the local polarization. That's what we call in our jargon extended DMT. And of course, then uh, the, the physical effect would be that the, the incidental phase has less screening than the metallic phase. And in principle, one can calculate through the transition how this changes the nature of screen. Okay, uh, my, the second part of my question is was just uh, on the physical ground. What is, if any, the role of long range interaction in the mode transition? Since if you have a narrow band, you would expect uh, the screening is right. ineffective. So, I, I actually, I don't think this question is uh, completely fully understood. So, uh, I'm also not going to be not. Uh, going to commit myself too much. What I believe is that in the um, sort of higher temperature regime uh, of systems that have a, a more critical endpoint like the DDTs or V203, this change of the nature of screening, because of course screening is not only from that narrow band, that's the key point, right? Screening is from all the other electrons, which already do a great job, even in the localized phase. For example, if you calculate the uh, unscreen matrix element of the Coulomb interaction in the in atomic wave functions in the insulator, that would be 25 V. If you calculate the screened Coulomb interaction, even in the insulator, uh, it's going to be 3 V, right? So uh, so all the electrons participate. This is why we need something like GW. But so if you are in this uh, region around the, the critical endpoint, I think the effect of screening is mostly, I mean, the effects you mentioned are mostly quantitative rather than qualitative. I don't think they fundamentally changed the, what's going on. The show is run by the on-site view. But if you go to lower uh, energy range, uh, and of course, to describe things like possible charge ordering, uh, the longer range is crucial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And, uh... Uh, it was really a very nice introductory talk for thank you for all this. thank you and, and thank you Sergio for your question we have Stefan Blugel who would like to ask a question now so Stefan the mic is yours okay hi uh, hello Stefan it was nice to see you and nice to hear you talk uh, I really enjoyed it uh, it's uh, for me uh, for, look, uh, for looking over time uh, to, it's very nice to see what kind of progress you have, your community has done over really a period of time, you know, it's a continuous success. Uh, it's very nice. Um, also the complexity of systems that you can uh, study today and uh, the type of interactions. I have one question which I, um, I have for myself, you know, uh, I feel the progress uh, on the usability of of, uh, dynamic mean field theory is uh, strongly uh, related to the solution of the quantum impurity problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I simply lost a little bit the overview, how is the, the progress here with system size? Uh, for example, what is, uh, when this, does the sign problem kicks in? Uh, does the new exascale computer help your community particularly? Um, uh, so to say, uh, can you can you manage also higher temperatures? Uh, could you elaborate a little bit in this area? Uh, where is the progress in this uh, right. fund in well, Thank you, today? Stefan. Uh, this is of yeah. course a, a absolutely key question. Uh, I as a uh, as a disclaimer, you know, uh, this question could be the subject of an entire talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to try to, to give you a, a, let's say, 30 second answer to that, and then we yeah. can discuss offline. Uh, so first of all, in terms of practical usability, I pulled out the slide that I showed briefly before. I think there's been a real tremendous effort by the community. And you know, I don't want to take credit for that. This happened due to the work of many, many, many people uh, in uh, putting together, putting forward a number of codes that make these calculations easier. Uh, for example, Sophie is going to tell us, uh, I hope, about solid DMFT, which is something that uh, she built with Alex Hampel uh, and continues to build today, which makes the access to these calculations a lot easier. But to answer your really difficult question, which is that where do we stand on impurity solvers? So uh, one of the workhorse 
of our met of our uh, everyday calculations is based on continuous time Monte Carlo. Uh, why? Because this is really something you can use uh, without any tweaks or without thinking too much about uh, adapting the code to what you are actually doing. Uh, you shouldn't use it with blind eyes, of course, but that's not what I'm saying. But it's kind of a, you know, every day's workhorse. And what are the limitations of this? Well, uh, there are basically two, two or three. Uh, well, first of all, there are the positive points. You know, we can handle five orbitals in a shell, for example, down to reasonably low temperatures, uh, like a few tens of Kelvin, uh, quite nicely these days with reasonable computer time. Uh, what are the limitations? The limitations uh, is that sometimes uh, some of these algorithms lead to a minus sign problem, even in the impurity context. This in particular happens when the hybridization functions as inter-orbital matrix elements, which corresponds to systems with low crystal symmetry. So, uh, or for example, in cluster DMFT calculations on large clusters, where the limiting step is really the minus sign problem. So that's one. Uh, another one is that all these algorithms function in uh, imaginary time. So if you want to calculate physical response functions and talk to experimentalists, you need to go back to the real axis, right? Yeah. Uh, to do that, uh, uh, um, a number of ideas have been proposed and implemented to uh, handle, imp to devise impurity solvers directly for real frequency or real time. So I think I have put some here on, oops, on this slide. Uh, for example, the numerical normalization group a la Wilson mm -hmm. is an excellent solver that can handle uh, this problem and provide good low energy resolution, but currently it is limited to about three orbitals per site. You can't really do more. So it's good for an outside with a T2G shell, okay? but uh, you're not gonna do a full five shell, mm -hmm. five D, uh, let alone an F uh, electron system mm -hmm. with this. Uh, there are other things being currently deployed. So there's been a merger with cancer network ideas, uh, so-called for cancer product states, FTPS algorithms, uh, which are being developed these days and in which uh, we have a lot of hope and so on. So, you know, there are progress, but basically uh, real frequency, lower temperatures, larger uh, local field of space or number of orbitals are the front lines. I have one additional question if Sarah permits. Um, I absolutely go for it. Um, do you see some hope uh, in the future to map uh, the, uh, the, the quantum impurity problem to a uh, algorithm suitable for a quantum computer? <laughs> well, we're going to have a talk later today about this, right? Okay. Uh, I didn't look very carefully at the program. Sorry. Uh, Yanis, who's going to, who's going to, I have seen Yanis' photo, this. but I did not know so, that he's talking about that. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So I do see some hope. In fact, uh, there are several groups uh, thinking about this, and it's a very, very natural uh, thing to think about because, you know, Despite all the uh, enthusiasm we have, or uh, some may have for uh, quantum computers, it, it, there's no hope that you're gonna treat a full solid with a quantum computer, I think, uh, even a very big molecule. And hence the notion of quantum embedding will be absolutely essential. So you'll have to partition your system into a small system, which you will do fully quantum mechanically and the rest of the system that you'll do uh, with classical means, most likely, and and with some feedback and self consistency behind be, between the two, and this is DMFT. So uh, I'm pretty sure that quantum embedding and DMFT methods will be key for all this. And hence, the question is: Can one uh, efficiently solve quantum impurity problem with a quantum algorithm? So right now, uh, with current quantum computers, there's been some success with one impurity site. I'm talking just about one mm -hmm. orbital. Okay, one one impurity site. And a couple of sites okay. in the bar, okay? I think my statement is fair. I hope it's fair. We're gonna he hear a talk a little later. And so, you know, these are things we can do with ED on the classical computer rather easily. But this is just the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And there are even 
Now, even some companies thinking about building special purpose computers. So it's a whole field which is uh, being developed. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Antoine, again, for, for a wonderful talk. Uh, in the interest of time, I would propose to move to Sophie's talk now. Uh, you know, we will have more opportunities to interact and ask Antoine's quest Antoine questions uh, in the second part of the event during the gather meeting. I know I have a couple that I would like to ask. So, but thank you again. And now I think it's time to move to Sophie Beck, uh, also from the Flatiron Institute in New York, who, as anticipated by Antoine, will describe for us a initial description of strongly correlated materials, combining density functional theory and dynamical mean field theory. Sophie, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks again for the for the introduction. And I uh, also want to thank the organizers for putting together this uh, wonderful event. And um, it's really a great pleasure to be part of this mixed gen webinar. Um, and I also want to thank Antoine both for joining me to uh, inviting me to join the session and also for giving this comprehensive overview, uh, which uh, over DMFT and strongly correlated materials, which allows me to keep my introduction very short. Uh, right, yeah, I'm a postdoc at uh, Flatiron Institute, and I will go, well, uh, continue along the lines of uh, combining dynamical mean field theory with ab initial methods like density functional theory. So I want to start with this uh, uh, overview over uh, strongly correlated materials for next generation electronics. Uh, this image and uh, uh, this table I took from this Nature article, uh, where the authors identify four emergent functions uh, for kind of next generation electronics. And obviously the one that I want to focus on is kind of this uh, labeled as Motronics, uh, where the key concept is, is electron correlation. And so the idea is that we can use the control parameters uh, such as band filling by doping or bandwidth control by applying pressure uh, to, to uh, as knobs for, for uh, technological applications like high uh, efficiency electronics or energy harvesting devices. And so what makes uh, these materials interesting for this purpose is that their electronic properties are described by a complex interplay between lattice, spin, orbital, and charge degrees of freedom. And this makes them very sensitive to small changes in external parameters, such as temperature, pressure, or doping. And uh, uh, so some of these, or many of these materials, as Antoine pointed out in several slides, many of these have uh, rich phase diagrams and emerging phenomena such as uh, high TC superconductivity, colossal magnetoresistance, or, or uh, the uh, MOP physics. And so speaking of, of motronic devices, another way to achieve these emerging phenomena is by sandwiching multiple of these materials uh, into, into heterostructures. And due to recent developments in thin film growth techniques, uh, it's really now possible to stack atoms by atoms uh, uh, on top of each other uh, and this creates this idea of a materials by design principle, where we could engineer materials to be in a specific state uh, that has uh, benefits for technological applications. And so here I'm just showing uh, three examples, like this is a prototype of a, of a mock transistor based on thin films of various niculate that supposedly switches much faster than, than semiconductor alternatives. Uh, this is an image of, of transparent conductors based on ultra thin films of, of strontium vanadate, uh, calcium vanadate, and then here's an example of, uh, of a prototype of a MOT uh, solar cell based on thin films of lanthanum bo 3 So this is uh, uh, in describing these materials is clearly, in, or also growing these for sure, uh, is clearly an exciting endeavor in material science. Uh, however, to do these calculations ab initio, such large scale uh, calculations, so this is you know, on the tens, uh, order of tens to 100 uh, atoms and multiple impurities, what we need is uh, is robust workflows and 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 methods. Okay, so I just finished my introduction. I will talk more about the DFD plus DMFD method that Antoine already introduced, uh, and then I will talk about uh, our recent implementation of charge full self consistency in the community codes quantum espresso vani ninety and tricks. And finally, I will also talk about uh, this uh, workflow that we've implemented, uh, uh, which is called solid DMFD to do these uh, calculations. OK, so this is uh, the overview over the workflow of uh, DFT plus DMFT. It is depicted here as a kind of a three-step process, uh, although 
Uh, the second part, uh, which is the downfolding, can, can also be done within the DFT code. But here I'm talking specifically about uh, the interface to, to Vani90 to do this. So I will briefly uh, summarize again and then go a little bit more in detail in the following uh, in the following slides. And I will also join Antoine in advertising the Jülich uh, Autumn School and the really comprehensive list of, of uh, books and lecture notes that you can find online. All right, so we start. Uh, in DFT, uh, take your favorite DFT code, you relax the structure, compute the ground state. Uh, and then we realize that some of the bands, especially uh, the low-lying D or F states, open open D or F sh uh, shells, uh, are not sufficiently or are not accurately captured within DFT. And so uh, we, we uh, create a downfolded model uh, for, these, for this uh, subspace. Uh, you know, initially this could just be projections on, it could just be atomic orbitals, but then uh, we have some op uh, uh, me um, methods for, for optimizing the spaces, like uh, constructing maximally localized funny functions, for example. Um, and once we have that, we can construct the overlap between the original Kohn-Sharm states and the Vanier functions uh, are, are something that we call projector functions. And this is uh, what we're going to need uh, in the DMFT self-consistency uh, to transform back and forth between the lattice and the impurity space. So once we have the Vanier functions, we can evaluate the, the kinetic uh, term of the Hubbard Hamiltonian that Antoine introduced. So then we need to add an interaction Hamiltonian. And I'll talk a little bit about this. And then we can do the DMFT calculations uh, for which we use the, the tricks library that Antoine also uh, introduced. And then we can do some post-processing like computing spectral properties. Okay, so I'll go a little bit more in detail. So I'm gonna talk about the, the different ingredients that go into such a calculation. So first are the, the target bands. So as I said, we usually construct maximally localized funny functions, uh, which are essentially the Kohn-Sharm states of band new and momentum K. Uh, we transform them into funny functions of lattice side I and orbital alpha. And this is more or less a Fourier transform, and then we have some, some gauge freedom, some phase factor that we can use to, to optimize the basis, and perhaps also some disentanglement procedures. And once we have that, we can evaluate the, the uh, Hamiltonian in, this, uh, in the spaces, and this gives us the, the hopping elements. Um, as I said, the overlap between the Kohn-Sharm states and, uh, uh, and the Vanier functions gives us these projector functions, and these we need uh, whenever we transform between the lattice and the local space. So the lattice screens function is momentum dependent, as Antoine said. Uh, in the downfolding routine, uh, we apply these projector functions uh, to the lattice screens function, and we we obtain the the local uh, the local greens function. Once we solve the impurity problem, we obtain the self energy, the local um, like in the orbital basis local self energy, and we can use these projector functions again to upfold it uh, to get. Now, as Antoine pointed out, uh, now have some momentum dependence in the in the band basis. Okay, so the other ingredient is the interaction Hamiltonian. So this first line is the most general form of a two-particle interaction. So this is a four-body operator. Uh, actually, I should correct this: the most general form for a local interaction. So each of these operators acts on the same side i. Uh, is a multi multi-orbital uh, uh, interaction, and then we have these uh, Coulomb integrals that we have to compute. And so uh, in the simplest case, if you had an isolated atom or uh, bunny functions that are very, very localized, uh, you can start with just computing the bare Coulomb interaction, where you just take the, the, you know, the usual Coulomb potential, uh, e, square, e square over R, and evaluate it in the bunny function basis that we've just created. Now, in a solid, of course, you have, uh, uh, you have ligand states, and they will act as, uh, as, as screening channels. So what we really should do is compute uh, the screened Coulomb interaction. So this is W, which is, uh, we can we can get from from the dielectric function uh, using methods like constraint and phase approximation. However, once we have that, uh, this object is still a complicated four ring tensor, and this is very challenging for 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 uh, the pure solvers. And so what we do is we use the symmetries of the system to reduce the complexity. And we can really break it down to, uh, depending on the symmetry, we can break it down to only a few parameters. For instance, if you have, again, this isolated atom, uh, the full D shell is, is degenerate. Uh, we have spherical symmetry. In this case, we can use the Slater parametrization, which is uh, three independent parameters. Even better, if you, we have a cubic environment, uh, like in, in, in transition metal oxides, uh, we have a, a separated T2G or EG shell, 
Uh, and then we can really express the, the interaction in terms of just uh, the direct, uh, direct Coulomb integral and the exchange parameter. And this is the, this is the hubbard kanamu parameterization. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients. Uh, what we need to pick is an impurity solver. Uh, so we talked a little bit, uh, Antoine uh, and, uh, and the audience, uh, we already discussed this a little bit. So here I'm using this uh, image of wrenches just to demonstrate that there's not a one size fits all kind of uh, impurity solver. They all have regimes where they work very well. And they all have regimes where they don't work so well. Um, but yeah, this is really, a zoo of, of, of different solvers. Uh, Antoine also talked about this. So there's a, a list of approximate solvers like Harji Fock, Hubbard One, and so on. And then the numerically exact solvers, uh, most importantly, Kono Monte Carlo, exact diagonalization, numerical renormalization group, density matrix renormalization group, and, and tensor network uh, based approaches. And here I also want to advertise for a more con comprehensive uh, uh, overview uh, the lecture by Olivier Pacoli from the Arnold Sommerfeld School. Okay, so then we've assumed we solved the impurity problem. We can do some post-processing. We can analyze the spectral properties. Uh, this might involve analytic continuation. Uh, if we've computed the, the, uh, the, the Green's function on the, on the Matsubara axis. So here's an example by my colleague, Shadon Kao. Um, this is again, the material that Antoine introduced, strontium 2 ruthenium 4 uh, This just shows an overview over different levels of theory in comparison to the, to the experiment, which is the blue uh, line in the background. Uh, you see that uh, for DFT, uh, well, the agreement is pretty bad. For pure DMFT as well, uh, once you introduce spin orbit coupling, you get rid of this, this well, you get this avoided crossing, but the, um, the size of the different Fermi sheets is still inc uh, incorrect. And only if you do DMFT, including spin orbit coupling, uh, you get very good agreement. And I want to mention that this is uh, with, uh, this was computed with uh, a tree tensor network solver, and this has been the first time that um, spin orbit coupling could be included at the, at the level of the impurity problem. And then you can do further post-processing like compute optical or thermal conductivity, two particle correlation functions, Hall and Seebeck coefficient or resistivity. Okay, so this concludes kind of the workflow. What I, what I uh, omitted so far is that, of course, uh, Antoine mentioned this, um, once we do this kind of uh, downfolding, we've actually kind of chopped our system into two subsystems and we allow charge reconstruction in one of these subsystems within DMFT. But uh, from a thermodynamical point of view, this means that we might no longer be at a stationary point because we're changing one of the systems. And what we really should do is bring these systems back in touch and allow the, the rest of the system to react to this. And this is uh, what I will talk about next. And then I also want to mention that this entire workflow is implemented in this, uh, in this um, uh, in this code solid DMFT that I will also talk about. So this uh, charge cell consistency, uh, this was a project with Alex Sample, Olivier uh, Pacoli, Claude Ida from ETH Zurich and, and Antoine. And uh, this is just more or less the same workflow as before, DFT, Vani 90 and then DMFT. What I want to point out here is uh, this feedback uh, from DMFT to the DFT code, which, uh, which is Delta N, which is uh, occupation updates. And so I'll just give you a brief overview of what, um, what the idea is. So we take the interacting charge density, which is kind of the integral over the lattice greens function. And we can separate this into two contributions, one which is the, the Kuhnsham uh, charge density, and then a correction, where the Kuhnsham charge density is just, uh, has just this usual form. So the idea is that we compute this delta rho and we feed it back to quantum espresso. And then we can compute an updated Kuhnsham charge density and iterate the whole loop. And so how to compute this, uh, we just take the difference between the interacting uh, lattice screens function and the, uh, the Kuhnsham uh, non-interacting uh, one. Uh, and we take the sum over Matsubara frequencies, which gives us a density, and then uh, we have these uh, occupation updates. And so what we do, so this occupation updates, this is a, an off-diagonal matrix uh, the or depicted as orange here. The trace is zero because we're not actually changing the number of electrons. We're just reshuffling the, the uh, contributions of the different orbitals. And then we embed this in the original Kuhn-Sham uh, occupation matrix, which is diagonal. And then we can re-diagonalize this, uh, compute an updated charge density, and compute an updated, uh, uh, compute updated wave functions for this, and then iterate the whole process. So I want to show you a few benchmarks. Uh, so uh, what what this uh, what the effect of this charge 
self-consistency can be. So this is again strontium-2 ruthenium-4. Um, and you see on the right-hand side, uh, you see the band structure um, for, for different iterations of the full charge self-consistency. And I want to remind you that only the zeroth iteration uh, is a band structure that corresponds to a physical uh, uh, charge density, which is the ground state. And one of the benefits of this interface via Vani 90 is that we now have access to, uh, you know, we can look at this visually, uh, how, how the, the landscape of the non-interacting part transforms. And so uh, then uh, I did, or uh, I used CT-hype uh, at, at uh, around 50 Kelvin. Uh, and then we can look at the, the um, imaginary part as a self-energy as a function of Matsubara frequencies. We can extract the quasi-particle weight uh, from a fourth order uh, fit, a polynomial. Uh, and look at the slope at, at zero frequencies. And you can see that uh, for the DXY orbital, there's virtually no change whatsoever. And the change is also very small for the XZ orbital. So really for this material, this effect is not so big. Actually, it's absent, yeah. So now uh, a, a more interesting example is calcium bo 3 which is an orthorhombic uh, uh, D1 uh, perovskite. Uh, what we know once we apply tensile epidextral strain, uh, we're lowering the energy of, of one of the orbitals. And since it only has one electron, this strongly favors the insulating state. So on the right-hand side is the occupation of the different orbitals and the spectral weight at the Fermi level as function of, of on-site repulsion. And you see that for the one-shot case uh, at around 4.7, uh, the system becomes insulating. And this goes in hand with a very strong increase in the orbital polarization, meaning that uh, one orbital is fully occupied and the rest are empty. If we do the charge self-consistent calculation, uh, this metal insulator transition is pushed to higher uh, higher U, meaning that it's uh, less correlated. And also this orbital polarization is much reduced. And we've benchmarked this against our uh, previous calculations uh, in the vast interface, and this shows uh, very good agreement. And we can also illustrate this a bit more um, looking at the changes in the charge density. So this is a scan, a 2D scan across uh, through the vanadium, uh, vanadium plane. And the blue indicates an increase in occupation. The red is a decrease in occupation. And you see that the DXY orbital, which is the blue one, has increased and the uh, XZ and YZ have decreased. And uh, so I'm plotting the change between the, um, the uh, the charge self-consistent charge density minus the initial ground state charge density. And if you compare this to the one-shot case, you see that this uh, this um, this change, uh, this orbital reconstruction, is overestimated in the one-shot case, as we've seen on the previous slide. And then one more example. Uh, this is uh, These are total energy calculations for cerium 203 So this is an F-shell system uh, for which I used the Hubbard-1 solver. Um, and here we uh, scanned the, the total energy as, um, for different strains. And you can see that uh, in com comparison also to the experimental value, uh, you can see that from PBE, from the DFT ground state uh, to the one shot case, uh, the, the equilibrium position changes to higher strain. And then for the charge self consistent one, uh, it grows a little bit further. Okay. Um, so, in summary about the charge self consistency, uh, the results are really uh, case dependent. So in general, I think one can say that the higher the symmetry of the system, the less of an effect one would expect. Uh, but clearly for, for systems with a lot of uh, charge reconstruction at the DMFT level, uh, this, this, is, uh, this should really be included. Um, the benefits of this implementation is, is, is mostly the Vanian IT ecosystem, which really allows a lot more uh, uh, optim optimization routines, uh, spread minimization, and the visual control over what happens uh, in the, in, in, in the, at the DFT level. Um, this is a fully open source implementation. It's fully MPI and K-paralyzed, meaning that this is also suited for, for larger systems like interfaces. And uh, this was included in the quantum espresso version uh, 7.0, the most recent one, also the most recent Trix version, and the workflow is implemented in Solid DMFT. Okay, so this brings me to my last part, uh, which is uh, this, uh, this code that uh, was, uh, uh, this, let's say this project was led by my colleague, Alex Ampel, um, but I also want to, uh, I want to say that uh, they're very. Uh, this is kind of a joint effort mm -hmm. with uh, two very talented uh, PhD students from ETH Zurich, uh, Max Merkel mm -hmm. and also Alberto, Alberto Carter. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with TRIX, TRIX stands for the Toolbox for Research on Interacting Quantum Systems. Uh, I've put the reference and the, and the website in, at, the, at the bottom. Uh, Solid DMFT is uh, a, a TRIX application. Um, and a flagship implementation for, for uh, 
of an issue DFT plus plus DMFT calculations. Uh, what we really put emphasis on is that uh, you know, this is a, a, this allows uh, really to scale up the number of calculations for the using a scriptable config file. Uh, it allows to track or allow reproducibility. We have versioning control. Uh, everything is stored in the HDF5 um, in an HDF5 archive, input and output. Uh, we have convergence metrics. And it also makes use or it has a uh, flexible impurity solver choice. Uh, so these are all the impurity solvers. Uh, practically all of that are implemented in tricks uh, can be used in solid DMFT. So this is a CT hype, CT sex, CT int, the, the fork tensor product state a solver that Antoine mentioned, hybrid one, uh, and, and more. And this can be installed like any other tricks application. And we have an extensive uh, documentation and tutorials on the website if you're if you're interested. So the way this is uh, used, uh, we, as I said, we have a scriptable config file. So uh, you choose the temperature, you can choose the, the solver, uh, you can choose the interaction, Hamiltonian, uh, how many iterations you want to do, the double counting, and then a bunch of uh, parameters for the, for the impurity solver. You run uh, the executable and you get a very easy um, overview over the, over the output. So this is just an observable file, the chemical potentials, function of iterations, the orbital occupations, and also a different file that shows the convergence metrics, like your convergence on the impurity grounds function or the vice field. And then all the rest, the, the remaining quantities like uh, grounds functions are stored in the HD5. Okay, and uh, I want to show two more uh, uh, demonstrations. So actually all of the calculations that I've showed in this in this talk were done with uh, solid DMFT, but I want to show two more uh, before, I'm, before I finish. Um, so this is um, again, this image you've seen before. Uh, now I want to talk about the stress-driven Lipschitz transition in strontium-2 ruthenium-04. So this was measured experimentally. Uh, when you focus on this, um, the gamma sheet, there's just a circular one and you apply compressive strain all, along uh, 100. You see that at the M2, M2 point, uh, this, uh, this sheet opens up, and this is a topological transition, uh, which has a number of, of interesting properties. Um, so I will do the same uh, that is shown on, on, this, on this plot, but uh, now with, uh, uh, with, uh, as a function of strain, where uh, red corresponds to zero strain and, and one corresponds to minus 1%. You see that at the DFT level, uh, we've already agreed that this agreement is, is or disagreement is pretty strong. But you see that there's no way to open uh, to open this, uh, this this gap. At the DMFT level, you do get this gap, but still have the have the crossing. Uh, if you do DFT plus spin orbit, um, again uh, the the critical strain is much uh, uh, overestimated. But only if you do DMFT. Uh, plus spin orbit coupling, you get the critical strain, which is actually uh, very consistent with the experimental uh, strain, which is something like uh, minus 0.4%. And I want to mention again this, uh, that this is also great success uh, of using this novel FTPS impurity solver, which really allows, as I mentioned, uh, to include the spin orbit coupling at the DMFT level. And then the final example is, uh, is, is, in, is a heterostructure. Uh, so this is an, an interface between lanthanum BO3 and strontium BO3. So this is a, a mod insulator and a correlated metal, uh, D2 occupation versus D1. Uh, and what is interesting about this interface is that uh, if you want to you know, build a stoichiometric in a stoichiometric way, uh, you have a chemically symmetric interface at both, at, both, uh, at both interfaces. However, in experiment, it was measured that uh, there was an electronic asymmetry. So this is data by, by Tan et al. from 2013. So you can see here uh, the, the STEM images, uh, which is, uh, they, they um, have an oxidation map where green is, is just indicates the lanthanum uh, uh, ions. And then red is the four plus state for the vanadium and blue is the three plus state. And you can clearly see that on the left-hand side, you still have four plus. On the right-hand side, you have three plus, even though the system is, is chemically symmetric. And we can simulate this. Um, so here, I'm, the blue lines I've extracted is, is, is uh, the experimental uh, average, uh, ex experimental data for, okay, so the, um, 
the proposition that was made in this paper is that uh, this, this asymmetry stems from a uh, strain relaxation along the C direction of the, an asymmetric strain relax relaxation along the C direction of the film. So um, I've taken the data from the paper and averaged over two periods, and you can see that there's, well, I'm simulating this as some, some sort of uh, sawtooth potential. Uh, so this really means that if it's positive, then it's elongated along the C direction. If it's negative, then it's kind of compressed. And the green one is now the strontium VO3 layers, and the red uh, orange one is the, is the lanthanum VO3. And then if you do the DMFT calculations, uh, you, can, you can see that um, uh, you really get for the, for the SVO layers, you get a D1, uh, you get a, a D1 occupation at the left interface and a, um, a D2 occupation on the right-hand side. And so this is, would correspond to a four plus oxidation state and a, and a, a three plus oxidation state. So this is, uh, these are kind of, again, large scale uh, computations. So this is uh, nine impurities. Uh, so uh, I don't have it in the top of my head how many atoms, but yeah, you, you can do the math. Um, right, so this brings me to my summary. I talked about uh, the ter self consistency, uh, the recent implementation, and uh, the, the potential effects that, that one can expect, and also that this is important for, for, for larger systems. Uh, I've shown you this, uh, this um, uh, DFT plus DMFT code, solid DMFT, that we've uh, implemented, which is based on, on tricks and interface to most DFT codes that are available in tricks DFT tools. And I kind of want to finish with uh, repeating some of the some of the things that Antoine mentioned about the next challenges, which is clearly on the side of uh, impurity solvers like stronger off-diagonal hybridization, the spin orbit coupling uh, more widely, uh, lower temperature, and also uh, in terms of more complicated systems like uh, treating long-range interaction, larger correlated subspace, and so on. And uh, with this, uh, I want to thank you, uh, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Sophie. This was really nice and quite impressive, I have to say. What we wait for participants to ask questions if they have some. Uh, I just was curious to understand a little bit better how you incorporate the description of strain in your calculation. So, are, are you really letting the lattice breathe, or are these sort of a sequence of uh, static calculations with different lattice parameters? Yeah. So, yeah. so the latter. Uh, the strain is incorporated at the DFT level, uh, not within DMFT. Okay, and in general. Because I mean, some of the applications that you were describing seem to imply interaction with external fields or, or you know, deformations of the system and so on and so forth. And is this easy or, or super difficult to incorporate in the theory? Uh, it depends really on on uh, which kind of external <laughs> uh, fields. Yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah, electrostatic fields are very challenging. Magnetic fields are not so challenging really depends on, on, on your system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Giorgio San Giovanni has a question, so please unmute yourself and ask it. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. Um, I was uh, glad to see this, this lanthanum vanadate example that you um, showed at the beginning and also in the end, uh, uh, right. So uh, we did um, this lanthanum vanadate calculations that you mentioned also for the solar cells. Um, but that was uh, okay without strong sum vanadate, but um, right, and this was still at the, at the DFT level. And we tried at that time some DFT plus DMFT calculation. And I was curious to um, to see to, to know from you if if you think in this case your um, charge cell consistency can be very uh, important because there is a, as you mentioned a, a polar. Um, this is a polar structure, so there is a charge um, electronic reconstruction and also probably distortions that can influence the whole um, heterostructure. And pro I would have guessed that the charge self consistency in this case is decisive. Do, do you have a feeling uh, um, about that? In, you showed some, some preliminary result, I guess, in the last uh, slide or one of the last. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for this great question. Um, about the solar cell, uh, one comment I have is uh, I actually have a, uh, I was fortunate to have a very interesting uh, collaboration with uh, Philip Werner and his, uh, and his uh, uh, um, uh, at that point postdoc, Francesco P uh, Pitocchi. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they did um, non-equilibrium DMFT calculations for uh, a, some reduced model of an original calculation uh, that was based on lanthanum VO3, DFT, lanthanum VO3, and strontium titanate. 
Uh, and this was really, really a very, very heavy and uh, much advanced calculation, I would say. So this is really not routineous. I would, yeah, definitely not. Um, so yes, I don't think, um, I think charge self consistency in non equilibrium DMFT for sure is going to be a later step. <laughs> uh, but okay, that being said, um, I fully agree. Uh, so let's, yeah, so I've kind of uh, presented this in the opposite direction that I should have. So these calculations for, for these interfaces, I, I did actually before the implementation of the full charge self consistency. Oh. And uh, yeah, and at some point it became um, like an unbearable. <clears throat> uh, hurdle somehow, because uh, I agree that uh, for these interfaces where you have charge transfer, uh, it really should, it, uh, it becomes, I think, very important uh, to to include the charge. Yeah, self -consistency. Think, yeah, this is part of the reason why at that time we prefer to stop at the DFT plus U level rather than, yes. yeah, thank you very much. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's have one last question from Jan Kunis, Jan. Oh, uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, very nice talk. Um, I would like to ask a question about uh, transition metal oxide. So you can choose your bases in different ways. Uh, you can choose uh, only the transition metal D bands, or you can include also the oxygen P bands explicitly. Sometimes you need to include more. And in some cases you have these multiple choices, but of course we would like to have a theory which does not depend on the choice of your bases. So can you can you comment on this how um, how the different choices compare to each other from point of view of the charge self consistency for example? Um, yes, yeah. thanks for the question. Uh, I will first comment on the on the more general level. Uh, I agree that it would be nice to have uh, something that is consistent where we can always use the same same kind of downfolded uh, model. Ideally, anyhow, we want to include all of the orbitals, all of the relevant 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 ones anyway. Um, at the current stage, uh, actually I had a discussion with Antoine about this last week. <laughs> uh, at the current stage, I would still say that including the, the ligand state, the, the oxygen P orbitals is, is somewhat challenging. Uh, one of the benefits of just using this very, uh, very heavily downfolded model uh, um, is that we have, we can think about, or it's, it's easier, easier to think about the occupancy of the different orbitals. Once we have this uh, kind of, we uh, remove these oxygen tails, um, it becomes much more challenging to, to understand some out of the physics. At least that's why what, uh, my experience. And then also on the technical side, the double counting problem becomes uh, again, uh, more difficult. For the charge self consistency, uh, again, I agree. I would say that, um, Again, for these interfaces, um, one thing that is important uh, for the charge transfer is that this will obviously change the charge transfer energy, so the energy difference between the oxygen P states and the transition metal uh, D states. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> ideally, uh, this should be included. And at this point, I think I have no good uh, idea how this will how this will work out. Uh, but yes, this would be an interesting certainly we something we should do. Systematic study, like in materials, like in vanadates, I guess the D band is pretty separated from the P bands. So that, then both models should give you consistent results, at least for certain properties, like I don't know, the mass renormalization, stuff like that. So did, did you try to somehow uh, compare these two approaches and say, well, if I use a larger U with uh, PD model, I get the same result as smaller U for D only model. Um, I have not done this extensively, but I think um, I'm pretty certain this was done, and I think this is possible. Uh, I don't have the the correct references in my head right now, but uh, I can. Uh, I'm pretty sure this was done. Maybe Antoine has a has a reference at the top of his head. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes indeed. Uh... Well, first of all, Sophie, great talk. Uh, just in, in uh, reply to, to your question, Jan, so of course, this is a difficult problem, right? I mean, there's been a lot of exploration of that with, uh, uh, you know, somewhat contrasting results. But one example I can quote in which this has been a success, I would say, uh, and also very physically relevant, <laughs> is the case of nickelates, uh, rare earth nickel 3, I mean, 113 nickelates in which the question of degree of orbital polarization uh, was uh, investigated both in a very large window, including ligand states, and 
uh, finally, the correct projection onto a low energy, very low energy, because in that case, it's too bad. Hamiltonian was also clarified. And in particular, in this case, the renormalization of U is absolutely crucial to get the physics right in the, in the low energy description. So that's a, a, an example of success. I'm sure there are many others with less success. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, Sophie. I, I totally share the idea that this was a great talk. And I mean, we're running late, but I think this is clearly a, a CCAM characteristic when the talks are interesting and there are interesting questions and discussion, in particular, if they're open questions, we really um, don't mind too much about time. I hope we're not imposing on anybody's patience. So now I think we are ready to move to Yanis Herlich from the Fraunhofer, Fraunhofer sorry, <laughs> Institute, who will probably satisfy Stefan's curiosity about dynamical mean field on quantum computers. Yanis, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Great. Yes. So uh, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for letting me speak here about the dynamical mean field theory on a quantum computer. Uh, I am from the Fraunhofer Institute for Mechanics of Materials in uh, Freiburg and uh, we started to investigate how quantum computers can enhance dynamical mean field theory calculations in the future. Uh, first, uh, although Antoine has already spent quite some time to introduce how dynamical mean field theory calculations uh, are going on, uh, let me first uh, show again, we have on the one side the regular crystal lattice and on the other side an impurity model where the impurity is connected to a bath. And uh, uh, we have, uh, due to that, on the one hand the lattice greens function and on the other hand the impurity greens function which is here presented in the Lehman representation. Uh, and now within the dynamical mean field theory self-consistency loop we get parameters for the impurity metal, metal from the lattice greens function, solve this impurity model to get the uh, impurity greens function, then uh, extract the auxiliary self energy from there, put it back into the lattice greens function to determine new parameters for the impurity model again until both the greens function of the lattice and the impurity greens function on the impurity side uh, become equal. Now the main point, as already mentioned in the two talks before, is uh, to have an efficient impurity solver for our impurity model. And the idea here is to use a quantum computer to solve this model. Uh, at first, in our approach, we basically replace the exact diagonalization with uh, uh, a quantum computing algorithm, uh, which uh, then provides us uh, both with the ground state uh, and the ground state energy, as well as the excited state and excited state energy, which we then can use to compute also on a quantum computer, the transition rates between the different states. Now for the ground state, uh, we want to perform the variational principle the computer can simulate the quantum system exactly. First, we have the Hamiltonian given as a uh, fermionic operator, or better, a uh, sum of uh, fermionic creation and annihilation operators. Qubits are uh, two level systems, basically, uh, quantum two level systems, where we can have all the states in between. So we have to map it uh, to uh, the fermionic states, the orbitals uh, to the qubits. And uh, in that way, uh, there are different ways to do this mapping. I used the jordan Wigner mapping uh, later on in the results I show. Uh, but basically, we transfer from fermionic creation and annihilation operators to spin operators, uh, which uh, are working on 
the qubits. And the Pauli words I wrote about here are then a list of uh, Pauli operators, every one working on one qubit. And uh, uh, due to the decomposition, we get several Pauli words for one operator. The second ingredient we have is an ansatz, uh, which is a quantum circuit that is instructions which are performed on a quantum computer to obtain some specific state. Therefore, we have this uh, parameter theta, which we can use to get to a specific state on the quantum computer, uh, which should be a state uh, later on, which can be used. Uh, so this answer should be chosen in the way that uh, with a specific set of parameters, we approach the eigenstate of the system. Now, combining both of these uh, ingredients, uh, we can set up a cost function. Uh, at first, the quantum computer runs a circuit for a specific set of parameters, uh, which results for each circuit in a specific uh, bit string. That is, in the end of the quantum computation, uh, we measure the probability of each uh, qubit to be in the one or in the zero state. And uh, using this bit string, as well as the Pauli words, we can construct and uh, calculate an expectation value, which we then use as a cost function, as a cost value, uh, to, as feedback to an optimizer. And this classical optimizer, which is, uh, runs on a classical computer, then optimizes the parameters present in the quantum circuit uh, to obtain the lowest energetic state. So we have just this part here on a quantum computer that is running a circuit with a specific set of parameters. And the set of parameters is optimized on a classical computer uh, to get as close as possible to the lowest energetic state. And here our cost function is uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian specific to the corresponding state, which we reach by setting this set of parameters. This is how the variational quantum eigensolver works. Now, with this setup, we only get the lowest energetic state. But uh, due to the Lehman representation, we also need uh, states which have an additional particle uh, com in comparison to the ground state, but also all excited states with an ex additional particle, as well as all excited states with a removed particle. And for getting all states with an additional a particle or a removed particle, we can use uh, an ansatz which has particle number conservation. Here I show an, as an example a quantum circuit with so called uh, with A gates of which the gates conserve uh, the particle number on the corresponding uh, in the whole system. That is, we move a fraction of the particle uh, occupied. Uh, of the occupation from qubit zero to qubit one or from qubit one to qubit uh, two, but the total number of particles in the system uh, is kept the same. At the beginning here, these uh, additional gates just imply that we uh, set specific say, states to be occupied initially. But using this ansatz with the BQE solver also gives only the lowest energetic state of the corresponding particle number subspace. To get all the others, we used the variational quantum deflation algorithm where we modify our cost function by penalizing the overlap of uh, previously found states. Therefore, having already found one state, we append the inverted uh, quantum circuit of the state we currently look for and measure the probability to get back in the ground state of the whole system. Therefore, going back to the all zero state 
means the second quantum circuit reverses the circuit uh, which uh, we had at first. And uh, when this has a high probab when this has a high probability, uh, those circuit uh, the second state we try out is uh, basically uh, has a big overlap of the previous one. And by penalizing this overlap, we can get all orthogonal states to previously found ones. And feeding this into the basic routine of the variational quantum eigensolver, uh, now with this penalty term in addition, we uh, can obtain all excited states as well as all excited eigenenergies. Next, I want to introduce the two-sided dynamical mean field theory model, which is uh, the most simplified case one can use for DMFT as one has only one impurity side, which is uh, this first part here uh, with interacting electrons and only one bar side where we have three electrons and the term which connects both of them. This, um, this model uh, is... Uh, quite useful, especially as we have at half filling uh, the exact solution of the self-energy available, uh, which was already shown by Potthoff in 2001. Uh, for half filling, we also have particle hole symmetry and degenerate, uh, degenerated excited states uh, for uh, n equals 1 and n equals 2. Here, I also labeled the ground state as well as all states with three particles as I will refer to them later on. Going further to some first results, I want to mention at first different uh, simulators I used to obtain these results. At first, the state vector simulator uh, analytically uses uh, uh, the state vector simulator yeah. uses li exact linear algebra yeah. uh, to simulate the exact state of the quantum circuit after applying all the different gates and therefore uh, uh, gives the exact state of the whole quantum system we have on a quantum would have on a quantum computer in contrast the chasm simulator uh, is also basically exactly performing all the different gates, but in the end, it does not uh, return the exact probability, uh, but samples it. So uh, imitating a perfect quantum computer, uh, where we still have a limited number of uh, uh, runs of the circuit. Uh, in uh, to make this point clear uh, in the limit of in a, on a quantum computer one would have the quantum circuit to run an infinite number of times to get the exact result of the state vector simulator but as one can all, only do it a finite number of times uh, one would get the result of the chasm simulator however both of these simulators do not include any of the uh, errors Real quantum, com real quantum computers would have. Now regarding the results here, uh, one can see that uh, the state vector simulator by uh, the blue crosses exactly reproduces the result, the analytic result uh, Potthoff provided in 2001. However, having only statistical noise already leads to a shift of the divergencies uh, to uh, smaller uh, frequencies uh, towards frequency zero uh, and also an additional small uh, uh, bump here around omega equals zero. The shift of uh, the singularities uh, is due to the fact that uh, uh, for the calculation of the transition rates, we also have only a finite sample and therefore an additional error, but also the states we prepared are only approximate eigenstates of the system. And therefore we have uh, 
a rather big error on this transition rate, uh, leading to the shift of uh, these uh, singularities. And in addition, uh, for this omega equals zero singularity, we have not an exact cancellation of uh, the zero points in the impurity Green's function, uh, the free impurity Green's function and the impurity Green's function. Due to the uh, Dyson equation, which is used to extract the self energy, uh, the zero po uh, these go in there uh, with their inverse, and due to the zero transitions of the impurity Green's function and the free impurity Green's function, uh, the sum of the singularities should uh, move each other. But we only have approximate eigen energies, and at that point, we can obtain an additional uh, uh, an additional singularity around omega equals zero. zero. Now, uh, in a paper which uh, has already done similar calculations as I present here, uh, it was suggested to replace the transition rate uh, by exploiting the uh, particle hole symmetry, the cancellation, and also exploiting the one can reformulate the transition rate uh, to by applying the particle hole symmetry, also calculate. Uh, the other relevant transition rate for this half-filled system. And when one uh, performs the simulation with this formula, one can see that uh, the result of the CASM simulator is also uh, exact at these uh, frequencies, uh, has singularities at uh, the same sing uh, singularities of the analytic result, but we still have uh, this additional singularity around omega equals zero, uh, which is still due to the only approximately obtained energy of the uh, of the states. And currently, I'm performing real quantum computing simulations on a quantum computer, and uh, are curious how the results will be there, especially as uh, there are additional errors. Due to, to uh, diff, due to each gate which is applied and uh, due to the measurement uh, one performs in the end. Now let me shortly summarize. Uh, I showed that the two-side DMFT model can in principle be solved uh, on a quantum computer by applying uh, simulations with quantum computer simulators. And uh, in one can enhance the solution of the impurity model by enforcing the uh, different symmetries which are present in the system. And uh, for uh, this, uh, to have a universal approach, one has to add an additional handling of the statistical errors in uh, the algorithm. For real quantum computers, one has to add, in addition, some error reduction uh, code and uh, some error mitigation of the results. Uh, let me finally uh, uh, just mention that uh, the work was uh, financed uh, by the uh, government of uh, Baden-Württemberg, a uh, state in Germany. And uh, with this, I conclude and are open for questions. Thank you very much, Yanis. This was very, very interesting. Uh, while we wait for questions for the audience, maybe I can ask, you, you mentioned the effect of uh, errors and noise and some strategies. So how delicate is the communication between the quantum computer and then, you know, the classical optimizer, for example, in all of this? Uh, in, uh, uh, in general, this hybrid approach is to have a classical optimizer and a quantum computer is uh, uh, thought to be the first uh, uh, 
good application for quantum computers uh, as uh, one can uh, to some extent go uh, uh, go over some noise uh, in the meantime uh, because uh, the optimizer will have to find the lowest energetic state. However, uh, doing real calculations is uh, still uh, really uh, still really depends on uh, to have uh, quantum circuits which are as short as possible to have uh, very low noise on uh, the system uh, because every uh, gate one applies especially uh, entangling gates between two qubits has an error of uh, about two percent and uh, having two percent for some ten uh, uh, gates one can still handle but uh, going above uh, that in some point uh, get, uh, the system will just uh, get really noisy and on the other hand uh, the error mitigation uh, of uh, the measurement errors is uh, doing quite well uh, which uh, is done by first simulating how uh, by just simulating first how uh, probable is to read the correct result if uh, some specific state is prepared so just preparing one qubit with uh, an occupied state and measuring it a thousand times so one can set up a matrix which uh, finally can be used to do measurement error mitigation uh, but in fact it's uh, uh, still quite a lot of work required to uh, be able to use quantum computing really as a more or less a black box with sophisticated results Yes, cool. Thank you, Yanis. I think that Antoine had a question. No? Yeah, I, uh, well, thank you, Yanis. This is very interesting. Um, my question is also in the direction of real quantum computers. So there are two things that can be done, right? One is to try to simulate uh, the noisy qubits of uh, uh, NISC uh, machines, right? Uh, the other uh, with classical algorithms, the other one is to actually run the thing on, on, on one of the available quantum computers. So, uh, have you tried any of those and uh, are you planning to? Uh, uh, I currently are doing some uh, variational quantum eigen solver calculations on uh, a real quantum computer, mm -hmm. and uh, it really uh, depends on. Uh, what you uh, how large the quantum circuits are which you simulate on the uh, system i have done uh, some pretty short uh, uh, calculations with a, a well-defined state for a quantum system uh, which had about six gates in total and uh, reached uh, the eigenvalue with an accuracy of uh, uh, about 5%, but uh, having used the UCCSD ansatz, so which uh, is motivated from quantum chemistry and has uh, about 100 uh, gates, uh, resulted in an error of uh, about 40%. So it really depends on uh, choosing the right uh, quantum circuit on the current hardware to get uh, reasonable mm -hmm. results. And there are some approaches uh, how to reduce the dependency on uh, the noise, uh, which, uh, are, uh, which can reduce the error. So I use this also for the UCCSD ansatz and uh, these additional approaches then reduce the error by 50%. So, one okay. really has to uh, think about what can be done and how to approach my, my other the question system. is scalability with the number of uh, sites in the bar. Uh, in fact, that's uh, the uh, most promising part of using quantum computers for each site or each uh, bath level. 
uh, one needs one additional qubit. So in principle, IBM provides the by now systems with one, 127 qubits. Uh, if one could use all of them efficiently, one would be able to simulate in principle a uh, system with 127 orbitals, but uh, they also introduced the quantum volume and uh, this says uh, basically how many qubits can efficiently be used. And currently it is about, on most systems they have, in the best case, you can use uh, six qubits and apply uh, somehow six uh, layers of gates on each of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So it's a mm -hmm. pretty small uh, yeah. system one can uh, simulate uh, reasonably currently. Thank you. Thank you. Yanis, I think we'll have to wait and see how this evolves, but it's, this is really, really intriguing. So I believe we're ready for our last uh, talk of the day. This is Petra Xi, Columbia University, and harmonic lattice dynamics from vibrational dynamic mean field theory. Petra, thank you, and thank you for waiting. <laughs> Go. Um, thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction. I would like to thank the organizer for organizing this great event and for giving me the opportunity to present our work. Um, I am a third year PhD student in Professor Birkerbach's group in Columbia University. Today, I would like to talk about our development of a method that we call vibrational DMFT to study the latest dynamics of strongly unharmonic materials. Um, you might already be familiar with this, but just to make sure we are on the same page, let me quickly introduce some background. The vibrational structure theory is working on the nuclear dynamics occurring on a potential uh, uh, on a bone of a hammer potential edge surface. For a periodic crystal, the vibrational lattice Hamiltonian looks like this. Um, here n are the latest translational vectors, alpha indexes the atoms in the unit cell, and q n alpha here is the displacement of a, a an atom from its equilibrium position. Um, if we expand in this ground state potential energy surface to second order in terms of displacement, one defines the Hessian matrix as the second derivative of the potential. Um, diagonalizing this Hessian matrix will give us the normal mode basis. So we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of four nodes. The first term here is everything within the harmonic approximation. But in general, we have residual interaction, meaning these phonons can interact with each other. Um, the primary computational treatment of phonon harmonicity in solids is through the use of green fun Green's function-based mean field theory. Here I introduce the phonon Green's function, which is also the object of interest in VDNFT. It relates to the equilibrium displacement auto time correlation function here. Um, in the non interacting limit, the harmonic Green's function is trivial and is written as this form, where capital omega square is the dynamical matrix, that is, the Hessian matrix in normal mode basis. Um, but more generally, if there is phonon phonon interaction, the Green's function given by is given by this form. Here, um, pi of k omega is the phonon self energy. There are some approaches trying to tackle the unharmonic effect with self, with this self energy, like the standard perturbation theory or our vibrational DMFT. One can also try to tackle the many body problem directly, such as molecular dynamic simulations. Um, but why do we care about unharmonicity? Um, phonon unharmonicity is measurable experimentally and is important in many physical phenomena. One of the most famous um, qualitative failures of the harmonic approximation is its inability to identify Five crystal structure that are stabilized at finite temperature. Um, for example, the perovskite strontium titanate is known to have a cubic crystal structure at room temperature, 
but a harmonic phonon calculation of this structure yields imaginary frequency, like the black dot down here, indicating a structural instability. Um, accounting for the unharmonicity at mean field level, shown in green curve here, um, it removes the imaginary frequency and thus correctly justifies a stable crystal structure at least temperature. But this is just a mean field result. There is no lifetime. One can use perturbation theory to account for lifetime, reflecting the fact that phonon excitations become stamped over time via the interaction with other phonons. In other words, phonon-phonon interaction causes temperature-dependent frequency shift and finite temperature lifetime. These uh, features of unharmonicity can also be captured by molecular dynamic simulation. However, when large supercell size and long times are necessary to resolve momenta throughout the Brion zone and to resolve low frequency dynamics, the cause of ND becomes intractable. So as those existing computational methods are limited by weak phonon-phonon interaction or computational efficiency, we develop a non-perturbative systematically improvable method that accounts for strong phonon phonon interactions. Um, follow on, I will first introduce the formalism of vibrational DMFT. Then I will show you our test of VDMFT on two model systems, on harmonic optical phonon and acoustic phonons. Um, completely Analogous to conventional DMFT, VDMFT is a self-consistent real space embedding approach that maps the unharmonic dynamics of a purity lattice onto an impurity problem where the spectral density is self-consistently tailored. The lattice Green's function defines by a self-energy generates a hybridization that carries the information about how an isolated size is hybridized with the rest of the latest. The hybridization defines the system path interaction in the impurity problem, that is the coupling between the unicell and the path of the harmonic oscillators. By reintroducing the unharmonicity within the unicell, that is the system Hamiltonian, we solve the system path problem with impurity solver and the self-energy, which describes the unharmonic effect, is extracted from the impurity Green's function. And as there is translational symmetry, the self-energy can be used to update the description of the latest Green's function, which generates a new impurity problem, and so on. So we can initiate the procedure by an initial guess of the self-energy and iterate until self-consistency is achieved. For the impurity problem, um, we have developed classical and quantum impurity solvers, depending on whether one thinks nuclear quantum effects is important in the problem of intrigues or not, one can choose from different solvers. Um, while I don't have time to talk about the detailed implementation of the impurity solver, I am happy to discuss more during the Q&A session or poster session. Um, so we first applied VDMFT to a simple one-dimensional chain of molecules connected by spring. There is local quartic potential within the molecule describing the unharmonic interatomic interaction and only harmonic um, intermolecular interactions. Um, initialized by neglecting the self-energy completely, the vibrational DMFT loop converge in about four iterations. So this color map is the converged phonon spectral function, and the gray curve here is harmonic dispersion. So as one might expect um, for a potential with quartic unharmonicity, the peak of spectral function are significantly hardened and are broadened, indicating a finite lifetime. This is the spectral function from latest molecular dynamic simulation, and D, which, uh, which includes all unharmonic potential, is considered as an exact method at classical limit. 
So you can see that the two spectral functions look quite similar, but the comparison may be easier if we summing over um, the momentum axis, which gives the phonon density of state. So here I plot the phonon density of state as a function of frequencies for non-interacting and interacting systems. We show that at increasing temperature, the density of state shows further phonon hardening meaning that it's shifting to the higher frequency and decreasing of the lifetime is independent of temperature. We can also see excellent agreement between our vibrational DMFT result and molecular dynamics result at all temperature considers. This great accuracy of single side um, vibrational DMFT can be attributed to purely local form of the unharmonic of the unharmonicity that define our model Hamiltonian. Um, noted that in terms of computational costs, the impurity problem contains far fewer atomic degrees of freedom than the full supercell. In the results shown here, in VDMFT, we are essentially simulating one harmonic oscillator coupled to a harmonic bath. And it already gives similar result as an molecular dynamic simulation of 200 coupled harmonic oscillators. Um, next, we test the possible importance of nuclear quantum effect by vibrational DMFT with a quantum impurity solver. Um, working on the same model, the same um, set of system parameter at the lowest temperature on previous page, this is the corresponding spectral function from quantum BDMFT, we observe that the spectral function is narrower and have, um, has more structure than the classical one. The structured features can be rationalized by comparing the density of state to the spectrum of a single isolated unharmonic site shown in blue curve here. Um, this is namely the atomic limit. We can see that the peaks are due to discrete transitions between adjacent eigenstate of the unharmonic oscillator weighted by their Boltzmann distribution and the transition probability. These transitions are responsible for the structure seen in latest density of state shown in the um, yellow curve here. Um, we further compare the quantum and classical density of state at three different temperatures, spanning in the same range as um, our previous um, temperature-dependent result. We see that nuclear quantum effect, as one might expect, is only important at low temperature limit. At high temperature, the two spectral functions are agree, um, agree nicely. So we see that in this very simple model, we see agreement with classical exact result and possible importance of quantum effect. But what about the performance of a harder problem? Um, here we test on our second model, a one-dimensional chain with near east neighbor Lena Jones potential that gives acoustic phonon. In this case, um, you see this uh, V of R is the pair potential um, inter-site pair potential. So clearly, single-site VDNFT cannot account for the non-local and harmonic interactions. It requires cell cellular extension of VDNFT. You can see in the cartoon shown here with two-site, three-site impurities, we could treat the interaction within the cluster exactly. Um, and when the cluster size approaches infinity, it is the same as simulating the exact dynamics of for the unharmonic lattice. So with cellular DMFT, we can include the non-local unharmonicity and systematically improve the accuracy. Um, so this is the spectral function obtained by molecular dynamic simulation for this lattice with Lena Jones pair potential. It crosses zero at zero momentum as a signature of acoustic phonon branch. I also plotted the dispersion on the harmonic um, approximation in blue dash curve and with self-consistent phonon theory. As we discussed earlier, the SCPH is a mean field method equivalent to Hartree-Fox theory. It determines a uh, it determines an effective non-interacting phonon 
and frequencies from a mean field harmonic potential by a factorization of quartic interactions. So as a result, we can see that it can predict frequency shift well, like the uh, agreement of the, this green curve with the ND result, but cannot give finite lifetime. We implement cellular BDMFT with a classical impurity solver. So this is the result with um, the cluster size equals to four. For clarity, we take the slice of the spectral function at Brian zone boundary. Um, these are just the spectral function at this specific momentum. But again, this is the harmonic limit. It shows it should be a delta function. I added a small broadening for clarity. The black curve is molecular dynamic result with very large line width. The result from cellular VDNFT with two sides has peak locates very away from the ND one. This can be understood due to the non-local unharmonicity in our model Hamiltonian, which requires larger cluster size to capture their effect. So if we enlarge the cluster size, uh, we see the vibrational DMFT spectral function gradually approaches the exact one. However, the convergence seems to be super slow because of the poor accuracy of the bare harmonic rings function that completely neglects non-local unharmonicity. For better performance, uh, we can improve upon a more accurate theory. Instead of the non-interacting Green's function, we can improve upon the mean field for non Green's function that has some information of non-local unharmonicity, but is still effectively harmonic. Here, um, I show the result with self-consistent phonon theory. So this SCPHVDNFT method treats non-local, um, sorry, treat local unharmonicity within the cluster exactly and the non-local protic unharmonicity at the mean field level. So as you might be thinking in mind, it is, it is analogous to um, Hartree-Fark plus BMFT, where non-local interactions are treated at the mean field level. The SCPH method itself uh, in the dashed green curve here overestimate the frequency, but because of this improved performance of SCPH theory, the convergence of DMFT with cluster size significantly improved. So um, comparing this um, largest cluster size, uh, NC equals to four, the dark green, green curve and the black curves, we see that classical DMFT is qualitatively correct in frequency shift and the phonon lifetime, but not agree very well. Um, we further study its performance as a function of temperature by plotting the phonon frequency and the lifetime obtained with different methods. The harmonic theory shows no temperature dependence. Also, the harmonic and the mean field theory give infinite lifetime, so it is not plotted in this lifetime plot. Clearly, the SCPH plus BDNFT lifetime um, is not yet converged, but it outperform other methods and it seems to converge in frequency as shown here. Um, it might also be interesting to note that the exact molecular dynamics lifetime around are uh, around uh, one here, indicating a nearly incoherent dynamic in the strongly interacting system. So namely it's a case that mean field methods can not deal with properly. So we are now able to build vibrational DMFT on top of different flavors of mean field approach. In other words, um, vibrational DMFT can be a framework to systematically improve upon existing theories like mean field theory or perturbation theories in a non perturbative manner. When calculations are performed in this way, we are guaranteed the advantages of mean field treatment of unharmonicity, such as the stabilization of high temperature phase that we see in the very beginning. So in summary, we introduced the single site and the cellular BDNFT with classical and quantum impurity solvers and combine it with low level theory. The result, particularly for optical phonon, are accurate and much cheaper comparing to classical exact method. Um, in the future, we are planning on implementing quantum impurity solvers that is capable of larger degrees of freedom and treating vibrational DMFT on atomic, atomistic 
materials to um, study their structural and dynamical properties. Finally, I want to thank my advisor, Professor Birkerbach, and thank the Birkerbach group for their warming support. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Petra, for giving this very nice presentation. So as usual, I'll get things started with a question. I was just curious to understand in your second example, um, it wasn't clear to me if you could actually see the computational advantage compared to MD. Because, and, and then the follow-up question is, what kind of gain do you expect for more general systems? Um, um, to your first questions, um, let me think. Um, um, you mean what is the computational advantage comparing to molecular dynamic simulations? Yes, because I mean, you, I, I'm not sure you converged here, and so I was just wondering if this is because you couldn't afford going further or. Oh, I see. Um, um, yeah, we, um, on the one hand, we, it is, we are, it is possible. And we, we did try that we can go further to like six or eight sites um, of the, 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 the cluster size. And uh, if we believe that this is converged, then it obviously um, has much lower computational cost comparing to molecular dynamic simulations. And you expect this to be transferable to generic systems in multi-dimensions and? Uh, yes. Yes. OK. So we have one question from the audience, from uh, Jamo Lim. And maybe, yeah, yeah go for me? it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the very interesting talk. So my question is about real materials. So in some real materials, there are cases where the anharmonicity is very localized, but there are long range harmonic interactions like the LO phonons. So would the single side approximation work in such cases? Uh, yes, I think so. I think they would be the, the, like the best model, the best, re the best material they will um, work. So for example, like molecular crystal, maybe a good example. The kind of materials. No further comment from Davey. Okay. Thank if, you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, if not, there is a question from Sergio Chuki again from the audience. Thank you very much for your very clear talk. And I, I would like to ask to ask you if you. Uh, if you have done some calculation for thermal transport, uh, at least in the local uh, uh, um, anharmonic case, I mean, in the most simple case in which you converge. Um, uh, right. Um, so personally, I haven't done any um, the any thermal transport um, calculation at all, but that is definitely a direction that we would like to work on. But uh, is it possible and is it feasible to, to do this kind of calculation within your approach? Um, do, you um, think, do you think it's the, is that an affordable task or not? Um, sorry, um, do you mean for a some specific um, materials or do you mean? No, I, 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 I refer uh, to the model. I mean, the model in which you have, uh, you have only local uh, anharmonicity. So the effect of uh, this anharmonicity on thermal transport. Uh -huh. Yes, I think that is possible. <laughs> Just like uh, in, in ordinary dynamic field theory or there is something different? So I see that Timothy <laughs> might also chip in. Okay. So maybe okay. we can <laughs> invite him to unmute as well. And then we can give a couple of minutes to this discussion okay. before wrapping things up. Okay, Timothy? Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Great, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. I think our expectation is that calculating the thermal conductivity will be very similar to calculations of the electronic conductivity in normal electronic DMFT. So there is a, you know, because we only get natural access to the one body Green's function, whereas the transport should be dictated by a two body Green's function, there's certainly an approximation of something like neglecting vertex corrections that will happen in uh thermal conductivity calculations but um we hope that that would work and of course with the cluster extension maybe it becomes improvable um and another analogous uh observable that we still have to look at is the um vibrational free energy um so again calculation of total energies by electronic structure with dmft is of course um now very powerful and so, although we've so far only looked at spectral quantities, we also want to test how accurately one could calculate the vibrational free energy at finite temperature from, uh, you know, cluster or, or few site DMFT. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you again, Petra, for this uh, excellent talk. Um, so now I think it is my turn to share the screen now for just a moment. Petra, if you could stop sharing yours, just uh... great. Thank you. And I don't want to take much time, but I do want to thank you all for staying with us. And you know, for those of you who have followed more than one installment of this uh, mixed gen, thank you for being with us. Um, those of you who have registered as participants, you know, you're more than welcome to join us on Gather Town for the second part of this uh, discussion. I propose that we take a few minutes uh, of rest after this very exciting but somewhat lengthy the set of uh, of uh, question and answers and talks and so you know let's let's meet there i would say at five plus six now if you're curious you can find uh, recordings and information on all previous installments of of uh, both this year and last year's mixed gen on our website you can see here where and again you know if you register uh, on our mailing list you will be um sure to receive information about what's going to happen next. So I think I can say that we will be back in October, uh, ready and fresh with a new exciting program. We're also very interested and curious in, in gathering information from you. So if you want to point us in the direction of interesting topics or speakers, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And with us, this, um, well, thank you again for, for staying with us. Um, a real pleasure. I, I think it's important to thank all the experienced speakers uh, of this session, in particular Antoine Georges for today, and all the younger members of our community who have contributed to this. Um, this has been really, really exciting for us. It's always good to get to know new people, and I hope it's going to be useful for you as well. So with this, thank you very much, and see you in the fall. Mm -hmm.